Welcome to Game Face, episode 217 on Sifted Games at Sifted.net. I'm Shane Satterfield, your host for the next couple hours as we spin you around the world of video games. We have one of the biggest video games of the year, possibly the generation we're going to talk about today. We're going to talk about The Last of Us Part 2. Uh, I'm sure all you guys have been grinding through that game uh, the last couple days, uh, and I'll be interested to see what you guys think uh, in the chat today. Um, along with me today, I have Matt Kyle. What's going on, Matt? Mm, not much. Finally got something to play. That's good. Yeah, something good to play, which is really nice. And something big and good mm -hmm. to play, I would add. Uh, we also have Mitch Sikorsky alongside us, uh, cranking out the TriCaster today. How's uh, how's things in the studio, Mitch? Quiet, like usual. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think a lot of people have moved out of our building, actually. Like, there's yeah. a lot of empty offices around us now. Um, hmm. So, yeah, which is good because we swear and stuff, and I'm sure a lot of people in our building, like, hate us. So, <laughs> they can eh. just keep moving away. <laughs> Fuck them. They've, they've had a reprieve uh, here. The uh, I drove by the old building on uh -huh. the way to, to to get to the store the other day, which I don't go that direction very often. They've really changed that place. Oh, it's completely different. Yeah. Yeah, they still got like, giant please lease our offices signs on it. So I guess they didn't really help. Yeah, they put like a huge like wrap on the building, yeah. like this big graphic that goes like all around it. It looks way nicer than when we were there, that's for sure. But I guess that's what happens when a big company comes in and rents the whole thing out. They put some cash into it. But anyway, um, obviously The Last of Us Part 2, I'm surprised that people are on the stream because I'm guessing a lot of you guys are maybe near the end or getting near the end. Uh, maybe some of you guys are playing the game while you're, you're uh, watching Game Face. Uh, we have a big episode. We have a lot to talk about. Uh, before we get going, uh, I do want to mention our poll of the week for uh, last week. There's a new poll of the week up right now, and actually it relates to The Last of Us Part 2. So if you head to sifted.net, uh, in the header there, there's a link to the new poll of the week. But last week's poll of the week was basically, what are your impressions of replacement E3? Now that we're a couple weeks into it, and you've kind of got the lay of the land. You know what's up with it. Uh, how do you feel about these replacement events for E3? And there were basically three options. There was bring back the real E3 immediately. Uh, there was, I actually think this is better than the old E3. And then there was, it feels kind of about the same to me. Uh, Matt, have you looked at the results of this? No. What do you predict will be the most popular? I mean, with our audience, I would think they want the old E3 back. Okay. Um, and you're right. <laughs> and not... And not in small numbers either. 62% of respondents to the poll chose mm -hmm. bring E3 back the way it used to be for 2021. Yeah, that makes sense. That's I mean, pretty overwhelming. I mean, look, I don't really care about um, kind of the E3 experience beyond going to the extracurricular stuff where I see my friends. Mm -hmm. um, but like, it's real hard to keep track of all this shit. It is. Like, yeah. I missed the EA thing because I completely forgot about it and had to watch it later. Like, and I and believe me, there was a thing in that I cared about. Yeah, you know, it's there like, definitely it, was. It's just you know, and I it's 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 not so much that everyone has to go to the LA Convention Center, but maybe we could do it all in a one week. Yeah. You know, like like yeah. just so like I can kind of know when all that's coming and it's or not maybe quite so even spread like out. Two weeks, I think. Two yeah, weeks like just to get away with that probably. Like designate a smaller space of time so we can get that headspace locked in, as opposed to like all summer. You know, I mean, it's cool that Alf's back in vlog form and all that, but like, <laughs> yeah. come on, like, yeah. like, it's it's a little much, especially because it just makes it more annoying when something's underwhelming. Yeah, you know, because like it was that's the thing for today or the thing for the next three days, and like it sucked, and you're kind of like, okay, I guess I'll wait and hope the next thing's better, and then it's like more. Tra it's it's better when it's just like a rapid fire, like even if it's two weeks, it's like a more rapid fire sort of like hit of things so if something's not so great you can move on to the next thing pretty fast that's that's the only thing that really you know as, as an as a home viewer that's kind of the stuff that i my biggest takeaway now anyone watching the video version of the show probably already saw the rest of the poll results for, but for the sake of the people who are going to listen to the audio only version of this i'm going to go through the rest of, of the results uh 14 percent of respondents said that they felt what's happening now is better than a normal e3 would be and 24% said it feels about the same. That seems weird. 
<laughs> it doesn't seem anywhere near the same to me, but I guess because I'm usually a participant, uh, it, it mm -hmm. probably has a different effect on me. But even on, from a site's perspective, it's just everything's just drawn out and dragged out. Um, I don't know. It, and, you know. If I weren't covering a lot of this stuff and doing Sifted HQ and things like that, Matt, I probably would have been with you. I probably would have missed a lot of this stuff altogether. Um, but it's something that I have to keep track of because of the stuff I do for Sifted. But otherwise it probably would have flown under the radar for me too. So interesting results. I am a, I am actually surprised that 62% said that they wanted the old E3 back. I thought it would win, but I thought it would win narrowly over um, it's better this time. Because I thought some, I'm surprised better is last, honestly. Um, I thought some people would like the fact that they weren't just getting pounded over the head with media for like two or three days straight and then left scrambling to try to make sense. That's kind of something a lot of people like, though. You know? I guess. It's like yeah. Christmas, everything, you get all your presents at once. Yeah, I guess That was so. kind of the nice thing. Was, like, some people really liked that night and early on before I became a jaded old man. Like, <laughs> that was one of the things I liked was like you just got like immersed in all this stuff um, yeah. for like a week. And it was even better when I started getting to go and being part of it. But like, like, I get that. I get, like, why you'd want to be just, you know, you know, to kind of a clockwork orange prior eyeballs open and, like, hammer it into my face <laughs> kind of thing. I get it. Like, you know, I, 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 I don't feel that way anymore, but I identify with that opinion. For the record, I did vote for bring the old E3 back in 2021, just to put it out there. Um, but interesting poll, nevertheless. Like I said, there's another poll up right now about The Last of Us Part Two. Uh, you'll have all week to go and vote in that poll, and we'll talk about it on Game Face 218. Uh, with that, let's get into the show proper. And a perfect segue from what we just discussed is EA's replacement E3 2020 press conference called EA Play 2020. Uh, the whole thing lasted about 40 minutes. I was kind of surprised mm -hmm. at how short it was in general. They had almost nothing. It was, it was, it was that, that felt like E3. That, <laughs> <laughs> that part of it. <laughs> the, the EA, EA brought E3 just like every other year. Well, it was funny on the, uh, on the story on Sifted for the live stream, somebody went like one of the first comments was, oh God, here we go. And I replied, I'm like, let's try to stay positive. <laughs> and at the end, I was like, oh, he was right. He was totally right. Uh, yeah, it was not, it definitely didn't blow, blow the doors off the barn or anything. Uh, but they did make, I don't know, a handful of announcements and we're going to talk about them. Uh, the first thing that they focus on, we're going to go in the order that they actually happen in the event. Mm -hmm. uh, the first thing they talked about was Apex Legends. How do you feel about them leading their E3 2020 press conference with that? Uh, it's a bold strategy, Cotton. Um, I think it was a sign of what was to come with the rest of the Yeah, presentation. like actually when I saw, I mean, because I, I didn't know anything about the conference because I missed it. Um, and then I watched, I got, when I, because uh, I was out and I, uh, when I remembered that I missed it, I pulled up the squadrons thing on my phone to watch it. Uh -huh. And then I didn't watch the rest of it till I got back. And when I, when, when um, I slowed it up and the first thing was Apex Legends, I was like, oh, Squadrons <laughs> is the only thing I'm going to care about in this. <laughs> I, I already know that. Like, here we go. I mean, um, I mean, on the flip side, it's nice that they remembered Apex Legends is a thing because it feels like they sort of left that. Cow. I mean, I get why they did it. It's a cash cow, but like, I, I am always astounded by how anemic their, like, update and content schedule is for that game in comparison to Fortnite. And I realize Fortnite is a giant juggernaut can throw money at anything forever, but like it, I, you've chosen to compete with this thing in their arena. And like, it just doesn't feel like apex legends gives people a reason to keep coming back. Even my friends who love apex legends and like yeah. it better than Fortnite, go back to Fortnite because nothing's happening in it's apex content legends. Creep. Yeah. It's too slow. They don't put out new content. Well, they're trying to fix that. Yes. And their big announcement was that they have a new expansion coming out called a lost treasures actually i think it maybe is out today it came out it's coming out the 23rd um that would be today yes yep so that's that just dropped today perfect timing i guess for for us to talk about it um but even you know i looked at that dlc drop and i'm like you know as somebody who played the game when it first came out a good bit i wouldn't say i got like hooked on it or addicted to it but i played it for like a good week and i enjoyed it um but i is to your point, I never see anything that'll draw me back. They're like, hey, here's this new gun. It's like, 
Bro, I don't even know what the 80 guns are already in the game. Like, if they're trying to get new people to the game, I feel like they're going about it the wrong way. I feel like they're they're playing to the base, and they're like, mm-hmm. hey, here's this obscure gun that only, like, oh. 5% of our audience knows about. Like, well, I don't know I, if they're playing to the base too well either, because my two friends who play who really like Apex Legends did also didn't see the presentation, so when I watched it, they were like, like, oh, is there, is it, what's, what's the new map? Tell me what the new map is. And I'm like, mm, there's no new map. And they're like, uh, you must be reading, you must be watching it wrong. You don't know what you're looking at because you don't play the game. And I'm like, no, I don't think there's a new map here. I think they added to an existing map, but I don't think there's a new map. And they're like, mm, I don't, and then like later, like when they looked at it, they're like, no, you're right. There's no new map. <laughs> I told you. Like, yeah. I mean, look, adding a new map to a Battle Royale game is a big deal. It's huge. Yeah. Like, that I think doesn't, Vincent I, in his predictions article said that he expected the new map next year. So he was actually, Vincent's been yeah. on the money, man. His, his, his entirely too many predictions articles for these events have been like scarily accurate. Like I'm starting to wonder if he's like a mole or something. Yeah. <laughs> Seriously, like he's done a really, really good job, and he hey. he predicted that. He said you won't get another map until next year. So, I mean, um, some of, some of us are just good at seeing where these things are going, which we will get to later. Yes, we will. Absolutely, <laughs> absolutely, man. I I put a certain topic in this show just for that. So yeah. we'll get to that in a bit. Otherwise, we're waiting until August. And that's, that's, right. Fun. <laughs> that's right. That's uh, right. But actually, EA did make some pretty big announcements about Apex Legends. That that actually will move the, me- the needle a little bit. Uh, Crossplay is coming this fall. That's a big deal. That's Getting good. everybody on board. That's a big deal. It's also coming to Switch this fall um, with the cross-platform pl- pl- play. So it's going to be one united community going forward um, for the game that will undoubtedly help its prospects. It helped, it's helped with every game that's gone across platforms. So that's big stuff, but yeah, content a little slim, I think. Um, Next up, just kind of mentioned offhand by EA, kind of a big deal. EA announced that it will release seven switch games in the next 12 months. So, we already know a couple of them, obviously. We know, you know, Madden and FIFA, they're going to get, like, the gimped versions of those. Mm-hmm. But beyond that, we don't know a whole lot about what EA is bringing. They have all these remasters, like um, Burnout, Paradise is coming. Um, so that's a third one. So, But there's still at least, like, a trio of games that we really have no idea Mass what they Mass Effect could. 1, Mass Effect 2, Mass Effect 3. <laughs> you think you that's what it is? Apex Legends. That's probably Apex Legends. That's four. Yeah. yeah. That counts. Yep. I mean, it's not going to be anything particularly new. I, I mean, I think it's just me remasters and. You don't think EA will or, create something just for Switch? Not a chance in hell. I don't think so either. It's a shame. But. Uh, EA just has no interest, which is weird because EA usually follows. You know, they follow the money. You know, they want something that'll pay out fast and big. Mm-hmm. And the attach rate, software attach rate on the Switch would indicate that if you make something that appeals to the Switch audience, you will get that fast and big payout. Yeah. But EA just doesn't seem to think they're capable of it. That's the only conclusion I can possibly draw. I mean, or they I mean, I'm sure they blame it on the idea that, oh, Nintendo fans only buy Nintendo games. But, you know, far as we can tell, like from something like Skyrim, that's not true if you position it properly. But Vincent seems- is saying that they've announced what all seven games are. Would you share it in yeah. chat, Vincent, what the games are? He said Jeff Grubb from Venture Beat. Jeff Grubb's become like the new Jason Schreier. Isn't it funny? Like, literally, like, the day Jason Schreier goes to Bloomberg, he kind of steps in and starts doing the stuff that Jason's been doing. Uh, so here it is from Vincent. Lost in Random, FIFA Legacy, Burnout, Apex Legend, uh, Velen Studios game? A remaster of Need for Speed Hot Pursuit from 2010 and a port of Battle for Neighborville, which is the Plants vs. Zombies third-person competitive shooter. So those last three, he says those last three are Grubbs reporting. Okay. The first four are confirmed. Yeah, so there you go. Um, not exactly exciting, but it's better than nothing. I mean, EA is playing it about as safe as possible. On yeah, Switch. I mean, considering they went through that period where they're just like, we aren't doing anything for the Switch yeah. anyway. Like, that's... It's progress, I guess. Like at least, you know, EA, at some point, EA had to acknowledge that, like, you can't ignore the, the platform that huge. Like, it's stupid to ignore. It is, and I, but I also like EA. I, something must have changed internally at EA's in terms in terms of strategy because, like, that plus like putting all their stuff on Steam all of a sudden. Yeah, that's right. Um, that's huge. Like, yeah, it is. Like, I actually got a couple things from that because, like, I don't, I don't, I don't play with Origin. You know, I mean, yeah. I have Origin. Periodically, I the last time I opened it. <laughs> no, no. Well, the only reason I had Origin at all was because of uh, Old Republic, and Old Republic doesn't need you to open Origin to play Old Republic, so I haven't opened that in years. 
yeah. but like yeah so i got a I, like i think i got actually hot pursuit <laughs> on on uh on that because like yeah i wanted to have it on pc and i better have it i prefer to have it on steam but like I don't know where that came from, and they've done a big rollout, like a periodic rollout. Like, here's more, here's more, here's more. Cool. Like, I think everyone's it. just starting to get what Pactor honestly has been talking about for a really long time, and that's that. Like, everything should just be platform agnostic because yeah. the more just like let me give you money the way I want to give you money. Yeah, it's like the more platforms your product is on, the more money you can make. It's just like mm -hmm. you know us getting our podcast distributed out to all these new podcast services that could make a difference. More people are going to listen to the show, and then they're going to go to our Patreon. It that it's all about distribution really so mm -hmm. i don't know i i think ea at least in this section you know it's good it's paying some lip service to switch but it still needs to kind of put up or shut up like at least like really work on the sports games for switch so they're not just i mean they're pretty much trash so i don't know it, it's an olive branch i think to uh switch owners um but i don't think it's much more than that uh, next up, EA started talking about its indie imprint called EA Originals, um, and it showed a trio of basically indie games that EA is going to publish here in the near future. Now, one of one of these, or actually almost all of them, were known quantities before. We just mm -hmm. hadn't really gotten looks at them. Uh, the first game is the next game from Joseph Faris, the F the Oscars guy. Uh, it's called It Takes Two. Uh, they didn't show much of this. In fact, you know, the... The debut trailer for this was him. Like, yeah. Are you are you sick of Joseph Forrest yet, Matt? I don't know if I'd say sick of him. I just I he never he never made an impression on me beyond like I probably don't want to hang out with him. You I know, mean, like, I like, just feel like he's just reached a total saturation point. Like the first, and we've. I don't think his saturation point was very high to begin with. It like, was. It, it was. Like I realize EA doesn't have a lot of personality internally, but like yeah, it doesn't. They're, they're like leaning on him, like you know. I don't know, like he's like the he's new, a luminary or something. New, yeah. yeah, and I just, you know, like cool. You said fuck the Oscars on an award show. Like I don't. Also, like <laughs> that's all it took, apparently. Like I like Brothers a lot, but like Me a way too. out was just snooze fest. It's like mediocre. Yeah. This looks better, but like it's just there's there's a lot of like ego on display from this dude that I don't know if is particularly warranted. Yep. Um, so any, well, they showed his new game kind of like after we cut out all the footage of him being demonstrative and acting crazy. I think there was 40 seconds and I'm sure Mitch is figuring that out right now that there's only 40 seconds for this. Oh, game. we already finished it. I got to play <laughs> I'm it sure again. You, did. <laughs> <laughs> you can uh, roll it again. Man. Uh, <laughs> so um, there was like 40 seconds of footage and it wasn't even really the game. Like there was a couple short clips mm -hmm. of the game. The rest was like concept art. I really other than it being a cooperative game, which seems to be his thing. Yeah, that seems to definitely, like, he is on a one-man quest to bring back couch co-op, which I can support. I just, yeah, yeah. you know. It's an admirable cause. Yeah. Yeah, but, I just don't like, I don't know. Like, I, I, we've talked about Way Out before, and I just, like, I can't imagine a, a way to make a game less interesting to me in terms of premise and presentation. Um, hopefully this one's better. Uh Already, like even the little bit we saw is already more appealing to me. So I'd agree. I'd agree with that <laughs> for sure. Uh, the next game that that they discussed was called Lost in Random. Uh, this game was announced at E3 last year with just like a press release and some screens and a logo. Uh, and this was the first look that we actually got at it. It looks insane. I guess. Mm -hmm. it's the, what do you think of the art style? I mean, I like it. I don't. I. Yeah, it's it's odd. I don't know I mean, what to think of it quite yet. It's like but, a cheap, cheap man's version of like Nightmare Before Christmas. Like, yeah, like I mean, it, it it's got like a little nightmares flavor yeah. to it a little bit, um, which is fine. Like I don't, you know, I, it's better than doing more cell shading, but like, um, also a little bit of um, what was that graffiti game? Which one? Last year, get, yeah, last get up. Mark Echoes. No, it, no, the the magical one with the bullies oh, the one the, that came out like last year. Yeah, yeah, oh. on, on PlayStation. You know what I'm talking. I, about. I know what you're talking about. I can't that's that's the main thing I thought of. Concrete yeah. genie. Yeah, that's Concrete right. Concrete genie. genie. Yep. I mean, not as neon, but it had that sort of like grimy Oliver Twist look to it. And I will give it props because this is one of the few games that will use inanimate objects from board games as a playable character. So yeah. it can get in that genre with uh, no one can stop Mr. Domino. <laughs> yeah, so it's not a crowded field. <laughs> Very weird uh, to have a die as one of the characters in the game. Obviously, the die ties mm -hmm. into 
uh, the concept of the game and the gameplay and all that kind of also, stuff. Also, thank you for using the correct singular of dice, right? which yeah. I'm sure no one will do in the previews for the next <laughs> year and call him a dice, and yeah. it's going to drive me crazy. But um, I, I do what I can, Kyle. Yeah. <laughs> but it look, look, it does look interesting. Uh, if it, we've learned anything about these EA originals, though, it's like you really know, never know when they're going to come out. Um, Unraveled took a no. long time to come out after we saw that at E3 when it was debuted. But then um, Unraveled 2 came out like... Very really quick. fast. Yeah, like, it was really odd. It's like, oh, we got it now. We can just whip out another game in like three months or whatever. Mm -hmm. Pretty bizarre. And then the last thing that uh, EA showed under the originals imprint was Rocket Arena, another game that was announced a long time ago. Um, that was a game that was being an in, being basically published by its developer. Uh, EA picked it up to publish it. Um, and I'll say this, that game looks pretty damn good. <laughs> like, it's a, it's a mm -hmm. rocket launcher only hero based shooter um so you only can fire rockets and i think mm -hmm. that's a pretty cool concept um rocket I mean, there were so many mods of that like back in the old quake and unreal days yeah like, and i love those mods yeah. like I, and i love playing I mean, matches I think, i'm pretty sure one of them was actually called rocket arena it may have been actually actually no. i think you're right i think you may be right um but maybe they didn't trademark it so no, i'm pretty sure you didn't nobody trademarked the mod thing yeah. they made for quake 3 is yeah. well there also but was like, a mode in halo 3 you could do that too because my friends love right. that we love just playing with rockets that was like so much fun yeah the, in halo 3 though was never a permanent thing on the playlist though i remember no, it would I think show it was a up. custom setting you had to yeah do. it would it show up every once in a while and you could play it for like a couple days and then it would go away yeah um, we used to do that with um uh we we do we, you know we didn't do on you know competitive online but we did like you know our own private games and we would yeah. make up we made up a mode that was basically teams of two everyone got a warthog with rail guns and then everyone only had um, rocket launchers if you got blown off your warthog so it just became an explosive nonsense match and it was great so yeah. this is this is a this is a really fun way to play a shooter like I'm like when I saw this I'm like. That's weird that no one's done this really yeah, officially really before. I, I, and maybe they have, and I just haven't. But like, it really it, it's it's a good idea. If I think for a little little indie sort of like um, fun little game, like I'm into yep. it. JM I probably Rain. won't play it, but I'm into it. JM Rain, thank you for all the gift subs that you've given out. It's awesome. Thank you for subscribing with Twitch Prime. Um, he's shared 50 emotes already. Um, <laughs> Axel F, thank you for Twitch Prime. Um, I think I saw McWomble earlier. Subscribe to Twitch Prime. Thank you guys for all that stuff. Uh, what next? Uh, Matt. <laughs> yeah. Matt, after watching the presentation for the next game that we're about to talk about, I said to myself, Matt may never have to buy another video game. And I wasn't like, that wasn't even hyperbole or me exaggerating. Like literally, I think this may be a game that you can play for the rest of your life. And that game is Star Wars Squadrons. Um, this game to me has ended up being much more than I thought it was going to be as far as mm -hmm. content um, and longevity. Um, what do you think? I'm just going to let, let you have the floor, Matt. This is, this is all you brother. I mean, I think, uh, I think you're right. Like it's, I'm a little surprised it's $40. Yeah, because um, it does seem to have a full fledged campaign in it. Yeah. Um, my guess is it's priced the way it is because they just aren't sure if people will go for this. Um, yeah, you know, like flight sims, and this is you know, this is not a flight simulator, so you know exactly, but like it's a it's a it's a wing commander X wing style game that like just you know isn't made outside of niche PC gamer circles really anymore. Um, so they are testing the water here with something that they don't know what the market might be for it. I suggest that the market is very strong for it, especially since there's such a drought of Star Wars games. It would not necessarily be the only game I'd ever play again because there are no lightsabers in it. Okay. But, um, <laughs> Fair enough. but this is an element of Star Wars that has been neglected for 22 years. Um, I mean, you had the Rogue Squadron games, but uh, those are arcade shooters and not what this is. Um, there's a, you know, not just in the sense that this is like a, in the cockpit and manage the power levels, like do the mission thing, but because it's got, you know, five on a five multiplayer, um, it has kind of that squadron feel. It's got like all yeah. the old modes that people love from not just like X-Wing versus TIE Fighter, which was the multiplayer focused version of that game back in the day, but like they're kind of finally realizing a couple of the game modes from Battlefront, even the old Battlefront that the space battles had, whereas yeah. I used to say like, you know, if you made 
put some effort into this, like it could be really cool. I remember like you multi, got really into it. Yeah. Yeah. And the multi-stage battles in this look like they're really taking that and bringing it to the next level and making it feel like it has more of a progression and giving it a little strategy. Um, and I like that a lot. So um, it's uh everything here is very encouraging. Um, obviously we don't know what, it, whether it's, you know, really good or not until we get our hands on it and play it. Yeah. Um, you know, if I, I hope it's not too much like the Starfighter stuff in Battlefront two, because while that was improved, it was not on the level of what an X-Wing TIE fighter thing would need to be. You'd need yep. to have it much less auto targety. It would have to be a little more free form. Um, but I'm into it. Uh, the, the VR, being able to play it all in VR is fantastic, especially since it's supporting all headsets on all platforms, it looks like, including PSVR. Will you play um, it in VR the first time you play it? Probably not the first time, but, I, okay. but I'll, I'll play it in VR eventually. Also, like, if there's a big, notable visual improvement on PSVR 2, that could be enough to get me to buy PSVR 2. Yeah, just I think a this. lot of people may feel that way, actually. Because I really, really liked the VR mission they put in Battlefront 1 as the yep. Rogue One marketing tie-in. Yeah. Um, and I'm sure this is in part based on and largely inspired by the success of that. Not just, not because it was successful in the sense of, like, you know, it was free. That's not what I, but I think anyone who's almost anyone that can tolerate VR for any length of time, if you put that headset on and played that mission and you love Star Wars, you're like, yes, we need to do more of this. Like, I, I, I could totally see squadrons coming about purely because some executive played that Rogue One mission and it was like, why don't we have a full game of this? Yeah. Um, which is a very natural question to ask. A question I kept asking playing it. Um, so, yeah, I'm very excited about this one. Um, we've got some some good talent on uh, on the campaign. Uh, the campaign looks uh, more robust than I thought it would. Like they, Me you know, too. I'm surprised. So you, you can play as two, or wait, do you choose between two pilots or do you alternate between two throughout the campaign? I was having this discussion. I can figure it out. I was having this discussion with my friend um, who's also very excited, and she, like, she couldn't figure it. She thought we're going to, because she doesn't want to play the Empire. She only wants to play uh -huh. the Rebels. Uh -huh. um, and I'm not a fan of playing the playing the totalitarian space fascist, but I, <laughs> but I do love flying TIE fighters. Right, so exactly. I do want to play yeah. the Empire. Um, and um, like the way the, the VO in the, in, the, in the presentation made it sound like the campaign interleaves the two. But the fact that they showed the screen where you picked the, between where you the, choke, the two choke. pilots yeah. would indicate to me that you... Pick at one the very least, yeah, at the very least, you're choosing where to start, I guess. Yeah, but or I, maybe it, you play through from different perspectives, one from one side, one from the other. That would be my thinking. guess. Like, like you pick, you can play the rebel side of things, and then because the, it does take place immediately after Return of the Jedi, um, so it is sort of a, a wild space situation. We don't really know exactly what happened in terms of like space combat after that in in the new Disney canon. Um, so it will be interesting that way. Apparently, General Grievous is still around somehow. Like, yeah. there was, there was some and he says he's about still that. a threat. So I'm guessing he's the main antagonist. That'd be my Something guess. Something like that. Um, so that's cool. Uh, there's some, but know, no lightsabers. So no. Well, I mean, <laughs> which is he weird. Had, he has his ship. You know, yeah, who, right. I mean, who knows? There might be a moment where he jumps out of the. That's out true. of the ship, lands on your ship, and starts cutting it apart or something. It like would that. be cool if there were some kind of, like, finishers in the game where if you've already downed the opponent, you could fly up and then, like, quickly board the ship and maybe just slice, like, the nose cone off of it or something. Like, they could do something cool with that. Well, I think. nobody's a Jedi in this, so that's... All oh, right. The, yeah. That's they, the I guess issue. the best thing you could do is just, like, shoot them through, like, the cockpit or whatever. Yeah, yeah this uh, a little John Woo Star Wars there, but uh, yeah. <laughs> it's uh, I mean the, don't try the, anything at this point, man. The old Jedi Starfighter stuff had something sort of like that with the ability to finish people up with, with force powers yeah. from the from the cockpit. Yep. Um, but I it's you know I do see that kind of the pedigree of X Wing and Tie Fighter in this, but it's just it's interesting to watch this footage because the old X Wing and Tie Fighter games just didn't have anything as impactful as all the stuff that's oh, happening in this. Because oh yeah, it's it was a more they were more great. sterile games. The, the tech yeah. wasn't there, and also like the idea of Star Wars being quite such a slam bang, um, you know, huge. You know, you couldn't do battles like that, not just in games, but in movies. You know, like yeah. Return of the Jedi. <laughs> you couldn't even do it in films. The Battle of Endor and Return of the Jedi, I'm pretty sure, is still the most heavily composited film shots in the history of the medium. Like, yep. it, like especially because, like, you know, CG came along 10 years later and you just didn't need to do that anymore. You know, yep. but, like, 
so the, the, the you know the way you see kind of like the footage in this of like the Thai bombers going over and just slamming those bombs into the Corvettes, and yeah. it's just like yeah, like the like having a game that plays like Tie Fighter and X Wing, but has that modern presentation is going to be crazy. Like yep. like my mind still can't fully wrap around it, <laughs> and like that's pretty cool. So there are eight ships. Um, any glaring omissions, Matt? Anything that you're like, oh, why doesn't it have this? Um, what were the eight ships? We had uh, we had the four Rebel Starfighters. There's a Tie Reaper, the Tie Bomber, the Y Wing, the A Wing, obviously the X Wing. Um, I imagine there'll be a B Wing. Um, yeah. There's the U Wing, which is the 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 support ship, the equivalent of the Tie Reaper. Um, there's a Tie Interceptor, obviously. Right. Yep. So probably the, so the main the main omission and it doesn't make canon sense to have it here. But it's a reference to the old games. Um, is I'd love to see the Tie Defender, um, mm. which was the ship in the Tie Fighter expansion that was Thrawn's like pet project. It was it was basically cheating. Um, so uh, and actually it came back. It was you know obviously out of canon when the Disney takeover happened, but it came back in the CG series Rebels because Dave Filoni is a giant nerd and he brings stuff back from old Star Wars all the time. So Thrawn in that series is working on the TIE Defender project as an alter alternative to the Death Star. And uh, the TIE Defender in the old games was like, it had the firepower of a B wing, the speed of an A wing, the shields of a Y wing, and the maneuverability of an X wing. It was yeah, it was I can cheating. understand why it would. Now be. it doesn't have to be that powerful, <laughs> and it would be cool to see them come up with a new rebel fight. I mean, I could see this being like DLC or like an update later, like yeah. the you know the secret weapons expansion or something, and yep. like you bring in a Tie Defender and some kind of like you. That would actually be a really good opportunity to bring in um, the E wing, which was an expanded universe only fighter for for the uh, for the uh, rebels. Uh, I guess they were the old New Republic by then. Um, in the old comics, the Dark Empire comics, the E wings showed up, or uh, or the K wing, or things like that. You could do some really cool stuff, like kind of expanding out and bringing some old fa fan favorite ships back into the fold. But I think what they've got right now is about what it needs to be. Well, um, the other thing too is that there are fifty components that you can use to yeah, buff your ship. A lot ship. of customization. Yeah. So actually, so actually, now that we can kind of talk about, so we've got X wing, Y wing, A wing, U wing. And then we've got TIE Fighter, TIE Interceptor, TIE Bomber, TIE Reaper. So that's your okay. eight ships. Makes sense. Four on each side. Yeah. Um, I think I'm very interested. Five. I'm very interested in the balance on this game because yeah. so it's a five on five squadron thing. So I think the, the dog fighting that starts a, a match is going to be five on five in the middle of the battle. And the second phase is more of a fleet battle. So there'll be AI ships flying around. You'll be less directly engaged. The thing I'm interested in is like in the old games, it took about two TIE Fighters to match an X-Wing because the TIE Fighters don't have shields. Right. Um, so I'm curious how they're going to balance five on five and why you, they, how they'll make you want to play as a TIE Fighter ever. Yeah. Um, certainly. Based, because dogfighting, yeah. multiplayer and dogfighting games in t typically is awful. It just turns into this like, just chase, loop-de-loop. -loop, like I remember Star Fox 64. Do you remember playing mm -hmm. the multiplayer in that? Oh, yeah. It was absurd, um, but having five on five will guarantee that that type of stuff isn't going to happen. So I'm glad that they're making a team base. They may eventually release some kind of a free for all mode. I'm sure some people mm -hmm. will like that. But there will be. I'm, sure. I'm also curious about. So the Reaper and the U Wing are the support ships, the big, slower, more heavily armored ships, and I'm very interested to see how that works out. And actually, now that I think about it, since the B Wing's not in this, the B Wing would be the perfect companion to the TIE Defender if they did that as an expansion later. No. But um, I'm interested to see how sort of support ships work in this because that's a new wrinkle. And yeah, I'm assuming sure. that like that will kind of smart support ship use will kind of be what gives like a TIE Fighter a chance against and an And if X anyone wants to play support, because that often becomes the problem in a lot of games is finding the person who's willing to be mm -hmm. the support. Character. Well, that's the trick is they're going to have to make playing these, the U-Wing and the, and the Reaper really fun. Like you have to make you, or at least Typically make you feel support like support is not fun. I think that's why most people don't like it. You no, know, but, you're if, just but you know, if, other people. If, but if you're a big, you know, they're gunships basically. Yeah. Ewing and the and the Reaper are gunships. So if you can make them fun and formidable, like you might have something, especially have and place. and especially as long as you're rewarding someone properly in the post match with XP or whatever. Um, so that like that does somebody, make a big difference yeah, for sure. So if it makes it so like playing as a, as a support ship is a good way to progress, like you know that'll probably help some of it. That's a good um, point. I mean, look, I desperately want to play as a Tie Interceptor and an A Wing, which are my two favorite starships in the in the entire series. But like, will I play a U Wing and a Reaper if I get some cool stuff out of it? Absolutely. Sure. Uh, then the final points about the game it is, and this I don't I want to hear how you feel about this, Matt. It is not a game as a service. And I think mm -hmm. a lot of people just 
instinctively when they hear that they celebrate they're like it's not a game as a service because it's kind of a dirty word at this point but i'm wondering if maybe you would hope that this game would be a game as a service so that it actually continues longer no i i think i prefer it the way it is just because the game as a service does not guarantee longevity it's true um it also makes it so like you know like i think like we saw with anthem there's kind of a, you know, if it doesn't go well out of the gate, and I'm not saying this won't go well out of the gate, I think this game will do very well. Yeah. But like, if it doesn't go well out of the gate, you can kind of end up with this sort of limbo, drought, yeah. wasteland yep. that it's like, true. there's just nothing to do. And like, where they're like, we sad. need to overhaul it, but it's going to take 18 months. Yeah. And you end up getting and like, like so better this way. Or... And also, this way, the, the upgrades and the things you unlock can be more performance driven and not just like, you know, because if you do game as a service, they're going to make it all cosmetic. So nobody complains about it. It's like this way, at least like all the things you're unlocking are valid, are, are useful and upgrade parts and things that make the gameplay work better for you and that reward you for long-term or better play, which I think is how unlocks should work. You know, that's kind of how the Call of Duty model used to be before the game as a service thing horned in on it. Yeah. Um, and also because it's game, there's no game as a service element and, and there's not an alternate way to pay real money to unlock this stuff. Maybe the way to unlock this stuff won't take for fucking ever. That's you a good know? Point. Like yeah. so because that was a big thing with Battlefront 2 was not just that it they was a game as a service, but the grind to open any of this stuff that yep. was real money Bought. That's why I Otherwise, give up on games took forever. A service. I get tired of it, man. I get tired of having to kill like five thousand dudes to get a new mm -hmm. gun. Like I just, it's not for me. Um, I that's I why you know, and most most of the things don't do that anymore. You know, like guess why? Like you know, the stuff that's sold is cosmetic to make you look cool, and the stuff that's really gameplay oriented unlocks normally in the game. But this way, you know, EA is not very good at striking that balance in the past. So, and also, I I would very strongly suspect that. You know, considering Bob Iger, the head of Disney, had to call EA during the Battlefront 2 debacle and tell them stop fucking with our brand. Um, would not surprise me if Lucasfilm basically made a rule with them, like, no more of that in the, in the Star Wars games. Yep. So It's coming out October 2nd. Yeah. Uh, so it's not far away. Another it's, one of my predictions, by the way, that they had another Star Wars game we didn't know about. You, you absolutely this year. nailed it. Yep. You they said that. They need when? that Star Wars content out there. Yeah. You were absolutely that right. That was one right. of my uh, New Year's predictions, I think. Yeah. Yeah. That's what I'm saying. You predicted that a long time ago. Pretty impressive. Uh, then this is where, this is the point of EA's presentation where it started to fall apart for me. Where, yeah. but I. Oh, and, and Squadrons has crossplay too, right? Yes. Yes. I believe it yeah. does. Yes. That's very good too. I'm I'm happy about that because it means, yep. it means that like I will probably get that on PS4 so that I can play it VR later on PS5. Yep. But I know a lot of people that want to get it on PC or Xbox. Yep. Uh, and you're gonna need people and, to play with. So. Yeah. And now I don't have to worry about who I can play with. So yep. yeah, crossplay is if you know, there's no downside to it. Yep. So I'm glad he is embracing that. Yeah. Um, and so this is the part of most press conferences where you get the really good stuff. This is the Whoops. last like 10 <laughs> minutes of a press conference. One more thing. Yeah, th exactly. This is, you know, you're supposed to build up and then you have this big finale. So th to me, this is where EA's press conference just went right down the crapper. Um, <laughs> next, it showed, so FIFA, I don't know if you guys are aware. FIFA is one of the best selling games in the world year in and year out. It is one of the only franchises in the world that can compete with Call of Duty in that way, in that every year, at least 20 million sold, guaranteed. And so it's one of EA's biggest franchises. Ultimate Team drives tons of revenue for EA. So what does EA do with that game to show off the next gen version of it for the very first time ever? They lump it in with the trailer for Madden, which we've already seen and we had already gotten two trailers for, uh, why what like it, i don't understand what they're doing here like what is what what would rationale could ea have for doing that matt i don't know i got nothing like, I, like, I don't uh, know like are you trying to get him hooked in with madden and then like use it as a trojan horse to sell him on fifa is it like bait and switch or i, I my like, only guess would FIFA's be that more like popular than madden my only guess would be that they may you know I, I assume they do uh very close readings of of viewer engagement during these things and my guess would be that like considering the, the core gaming audience's tastes uh engagement drops during the sports section Maybe. So my guess would be they're just trying to get all this, the two major sports things kind of out in one burst so like people don't go away. 
I understand that for the live presentation, but then if you're going to go with that strategy, at the end you need to put out a, the trailer just mm-hmm. separately for FIFA. Like, there's no trailer just for FIFA. Well, especially 21. since, like, I mean, I don't care about sports games, but I'll watch a FIFA trailer. Like, yeah. FIFA's yeah. a good indicator, you know, much like NBA 2K, like, FIFA's it's a, a good indicator of, like, what we're dealing with next-gen-wise, what the animations look like. Some of that stuff's really impressive. Um, I don't follow soccer, but I do think it's fun to watch. Like, and, and like, I like to see, like, you know, the, the celebrations and all the, the you know, I, I, I like watching the FIFA stuff. I don't like it when they do like a 20 minute, like yeah. deep Pele dive documentary <laughs> thing, but like, I'm glad to see it every time just cause yeah. you know, and I, and like, apparently the story mode, I've, I've th- been tempted to pick it up a couple of times the last couple of years. Some people that, that have played it said the story mode is pretty good. Surprisingly um, good. Yeah. Um, do you Which think, makes me um, wonder what it takes Madden so long to get his act together, but you know, what are you going to do? Do you think maybe because they're using the same engine, like they're using that locomotive engine, that they just want to kind of self-promote them both within the same thing to say, hey, next gen, like our engine looks great on both of our sports games because they're great. Um, that's the I mean, it's possible. Think I just think it's a dumb decision. Oh, FIFA I agree. Is I think it's stupid. They should have given FIFA a spotlight, in my opinion. It might also just have been kind of as dumb as like, Oh, football fans don't care about soccer, and soccer fans don't care about football. So, so let's make them like, watch something. This, yeah, let's just do them both at the same time, so no one cares. Like, I uh, not Cirk in chat said. To be fair, I'm glad the sports section was way shorter this year. So, yeah, to, what, I mean, to your point, Matt, there are some people who are just like, I don't really care about sports games at all. I'm just glad that they're over with quickly. So. Yeah, I mean, I, certainly I don't care about the sports games as themselves, but I, I'm as we transition into a new generation, I'm always interested in what the sports games look like. Like yeah. that would, I guess, would yeah. be. Like they're a good barometer to see what's coming. Um, and so anyway, that segued into what was supposed to be EA's big PlayStation 5 Xbox Series X. Here's our <laughs> stuff. Check it out. Next and then gen. and then hey, ooh. and mm. then not not a lot ready to show. <laughs> what the hell? Okay, so you guys have probably been looking at the lower third for this topic all this time and being like, "What the hell was Shane thinking with that lower third?" This is what I was what it's talking about. What does it say? It's just basically like late start. Late start. Like mm. EA is not ready for next gen. <laughs> they obviously were not are not prepared. They're not ready to move. They don't have any new games coming to next gen. Uh, that are going to be there around the launch window. I can't believe that all we can get for Dragon Age 4 at this point is like three like stills? I can. Dragon. I've been saying for a long time, Dragon Age 4 is years and years away. Like 2023. Like we, we'll we be playing Dragon Age 4 the same year we're playing Starfield. Wow. Let me, let me, let me put it that way. So then they really do have nothing. <laughs> Pretty much. <laughs> they have nothing. I mean, I'm sure they got some Star Wars stuff in the pipeline. I'm sure, obviously, their yearly stuff is there. They showed um, a character model from Battlefield. Yeah. Like, dude, DICE. It's DICE's engine. So what this tells me is maybe Frostbite isn't going over so good right now on the next-gen platforms. I don't know. Or on the or it didn't go over so well on the current-gen right. platforms. Right, well, I mean, exactly. It really might be time to, you know, certainly it's smart that the sports games dropped it and got their own thing. Um, it's time to let that go. Like, just yeah. make your stuff, you know, what's, what's the most successful, you know, thing that, like, they've made recently uh, from EA is, you know, probably Fallen Order, which was unreal, which was because... Vince pretty much sounds like he There's sounds like no way they basically said we're not using your stupid Frostbite. engine for this. Yeah. We're gonna make it up with Unreal. Just just use Unreal Five. Just like stop stop yeah. trying to do the internal engine. It doesn't work. Like Frostbite was built to be a first person shooter engine, and that's pretty much all it does well. Yeah, and even so, that, I I well even uh, that it, it always maybe maybe this <laughs> it is works my out for multiplayer shooter. Yeah, and like maybe this is my weird stuff. perspective on like just having used the Frostbite stuff too much. But like when you play a Frostbite engine game, doesn't it kind of feel like you're playing like on thin ice? Yes, like it feels like everything's feels cardboardy. Like the whole thing could just crumble apart yeah. at any minute. Yes, I agree with you a thousand percent. Yes, I agree. And the campaigns built on Frostbite have all been abysmal. Uh, yeah. Some of that is just that the campaigns aren't good. But yeah. And then but, compared to like Titanfall 2, right. which is one of the greatest shooter campaigns ever made, I would say. I would, I would agree with that. Yeah. And that's the source engine. Yeah. That's <laughs> Half-Life 2's <laughs> engine. Like, yeah. it's not... So, it, it, <laughs> 
Anyway, they basically showed a couple stills, like moving stills from Dragon Age 4. They showed a character model from Battlefield, and they showed some vehicle it was renderings funny you mentioned, you, for presumably we, the next Need for Speed. I, you just you made me think of like because the other Dragon Age Dragon Age thing four we thing we saw was at the Game Awards, and that was also like a moving still image. It was, <laughs> it was. Yeah. yeah, we have two of those now. And maybe this still, whole maybe Dragon Age four is just like a tapestry. That's all it is. It's a text <laughs> adventure. <laughs> it's a point and click. They're safe in that revelation. If I start you. west of a White House, we gotta have some words. <laughs> EA. Well, I'll say this: like that whole next gen presentation was the worst next gen presentation I've seen so far. So. Um, we haven't seen a ton of them yet. We've only Very seen, on like, brand. Yeah, we've only seen a few, but that was the worst one that I've seen. I have no confidence right now that EA is primed and ready mm -hmm. for Generation Nine. Also, but like, isn't that kind of like just par for the course? Like, even, I even remember back in the old E3 days when we were doing live coverage for G4. Like, some of the higher ups would sometimes come to me and be like. Is EA going to be good this year, or yeah. are we just going to be like <laughs> even they knew stuck with like <laughs> broadcasting this for an hour? And I'm like, man, I don't know. Like, you, know, you never know. You never no. know with that. No, it's probably but probably not. not. Yeah. yeah. And one thing I forgot to mention too about FIFA is that the the PC version of FIFA, which should be the best looking version or near the best looking version, is not the same version as the Xbox Series X and PS5 versions. They're they're basing the PC version off of the PS4 and Xbox One build. Because so, those are, those have more full featured, I bet. Right. Yeah. I, I'm guessing they will be. They EA really does EA features. does tend to do that thing where the first entry of those franchises on the next gen system is some kind of like half. Oh yeah, they're, yeah. They have half the modes. Typically, they generally don't have any new features as far as like gameplay improvements and things like that. They basically are like, "There's Madden. It works, and all the teams are in there. All the players are in there. Have fun." Uh, That's the way it's always been. So, yes, yeah, not out of character for EA to not be on the cusp of you know the next generation that's coming. But this is also particularly bad, even by EA's standards. Um, if I were a stockholder right now, I would be feeling a little nervous because that's. Mm -hmm. That's what you're buying stocks for. You're not buying stocks for, um, you know, squadrons. You're buying stock for what is EA going to do in three years? And right yeah. now it's not looking very good. The stuff so. that doesn't rely on a license they may not have forever. Exactly. Yep. Um, and then they did close out the show. I'm surprised that they closed it out with this because there's a reason why it's a big deal. Um, so they closed the show with Skate 4, an announcement of Skate 4. We don't know it's called Skate 4 yet. It could be just Skate whatever subtitle. Um, but another scape is coming. Um, I thought it was funny that like I, one of the biggest responses to this I saw online was people worried about it being like some kind of mobile thing. Yeah. Or something. And I just thought it was really funny that the reaction to, you know, skate people have wanted, you know, skate fans have wanted a new skate for forever. And I mean, they even say in this, like your, your internet You're the comments reason made happening. this happen. Yeah. yeah. And like, they had the fan base for this had the exact same reaction that I had to squadrons leaking was like, this better not be stupid. Yeah. <laughs> like, and like, when that's the first response people have to both your skateboarding game and your star Wars <laughs> Starfighter game. <laughs> EA, you got an image problem. Yep. Just yep. saying. Absolutely. Um, so i you know, as a former skater, um, I guess I would still call myself a skater. I skate sometimes. I don't really do tricks anymore, but I use it as transportation sometimes. Um, am I excited about it? Yeah. I mean, the other part of it too is that, I mean, they basically admitted that they haven't even started the game yet. So it's a long ways away. I am surprised that they closed their press conference with this. Um, I, I kind of get it because it was driven by EA's community, but the fact that EA didn't want to publish a new game in the series until fans freaked out about it. it kind of shows you that they're not all that committed to it. I don't know. It just seemed weird. Uh, um, did you also read the read the article which the director said that it will be um, not exact words, but it's like it's going to be back to the old type of skate games and early in the series, but it's going to be bigger. Yeah. Yeah, that was like pretty much the only thing they really said about it. They're like, yeah. it'll be like the old skate, but bigger, which I think we all probably could have guessed, honestly. Well, um, it did so go anyway. through progression throughout its time. Like the, the camera change is very dramatic between skate one and skate three. Yeah. And there, I mean, I'm not saying difference. that they didn't do anything to the game. But no, I think, sure. I just think we assume that the next game in any franchise is always going to be bigger than the one that comes before, or otherwise you're probably not doing a good job. Right. Um, I think the bigger news is that it's going backwards in regards to um, 
what the original was like because I think that's what was the most appealing part about that one compared to Tony Hawk. Yep. It's what made it different from Tony Hawk for sure. Um, so anyway, that was EA's basically EA's E3 2020 press conference. Um, even by EA standards, which are pretty low, I would say that was bad. Um, I didn't not, not tops. I didn't come away from that excited about anything but squadrons. Yeah, if squadrons hadn't been there, like oh, what a what a bust. What a bust it would have been. So my letter grade for this is like D plus. Yeah. What about you, I'd man? I'd say I'd say D plus. If squadrons hadn't been there, I'd say F. Yeah. What about you, Mitch? I'll give it a C minus. I liked a couple of the indie games, but besides okay. that, I'm pretty much with you guys. It was it was a little lackluster. Yep. Um, there's always next year. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like I've been saying that about EA for literally like 24 years. Yep. <laughs> Hilarious. Okay, let's move on. We're going to talk next about the revival of a marsupial. We're going to talk about Crash Bandicoot 4. Things that should have stayed dead. Dead. <laughs> uh, Crash Bandicoot that. 4, it's about time. Uh, brand new game. Uh, coming in the franchise, the first real new game in the Crash franchise in like a decade. Um, well, at least. Has, yeah, it, it's when been was Crash 3? Yeah, it's been over a decade for sure. Uh, Crash least. Warped, that at least 10 years, because that came out when I was in middle school. Yeah, it's been a long freaking time. So finally a new game is coming. Um, obviously, Crash the- Warped came out in 1998. Wow. Oh, wait. Uh, yeah, elementary school. I was right. Never mind. Whoa. <laughs> Holy <laughs> crap. So this has been a long time years. coming. Do you think this ever would have happened if it weren't for the crazy success of Insane Trilogy? No. This, yeah. That's absolutely what, why this is happening. Yeah, it revived the franchise. It's alive, thanks to a remake of old games that I thought sucked when they came out. So <laughs> <laughs> Oh, I loved them as a kid. They were my favorite to play. Yeah, I could see that. Like I, I was think- an adult already when they came out so yeah i think if you're a kid it helped just like if you're if you if you're a kid and you had crash bandicoot games you you didn't know better yeah (laughs) unless they're a little easier to understand than a truly like open 3d platformer um they're kind of i'm sorry but um we were told by jason rubin that crash bandicoot was more 3d than mario 64 (laughs) could ever (laughs) dream of being Well, so, I, I think um, the that, biggest thing that's for one of those me, though, quotes was, that has not aged well. <laughs> well, the biggest thing Did, for me, though, when I was a kid, it, w- it came with a jam pack and it had that uh, staple sequence where uh, Crash is running towards the camera. Yeah. And I think mm-hmm. that was just so iconic and, and in mm-hmm. so many ways. And for as a kid to see that, that that made you excited to play it. So I think uh, that made me stop playing it. I hate this. <laughs> that's sequences. the worst like, part. It's like, like, hey, you know what? Right. Well, Hey, what if run, we got a platforming sequence like where you can't see what you're go- where you're going? Like, what the so hell bad. is that? Like, I get like, it's Jurassic Park all over again. You you you'd spend so much time what, figuring out if you could, you never stop to think if you should. Um, yeah. And then in Uncharted Four, they even make fun of it, where Nate they can't do. play it yeah, because he's great. running at the can. He's like, I can't even yeah. see what I'm doing. I'm like, yes, thank you, <laughs> Naughty Dog. Well, the you crazy later part. Acknowledging. The crazy part about it is that this one also has those run towards the screen sections. I think they're well, just going to have them. Mitch, I think Mitch is right. Like they're, they are iconic. Like yeah. they are. I mean, that's sort of like it's a shitty thing, but it is identified <laughs> yeah. with the Crash franchise. <laughs> it really like it's is, like yeah. you know, e- even if it's just because no one else is dumb enough to do it, that still counts as a trademark, you yeah. know, element. So yeah, it's going to be there. I mean, I will never ever play this game. Really? Like, so have you watched no. the trailer? Because what yeah, I was going to say next is that it actually is a lot different. It's way more open. It is more of like a uh, yeah, I see platformer that. I, this time. I just physically despise the Crash Bandicoot character. Oh, okay. Like, I don't like looking at him. I don't I don't really have an affinity for him, but I'm a sucker for a good 3D platformer. So I think the I think the new design, like the current, like the new design for him is much better. It's a big improvement yeah, over the old style. How do you guys feel about that? He looks a lot different. And I've seen I think it looks a lot people, better. I still hate him, but I think it looks don't better. Like it. I don't like it. I, I'm not a fan of the look. And uh, the one other thing I've noticed in this trailer, he's really floaty. And I don't, I liked how grounded, how much weight Crash had when he jumped. It's why I love uh, Melee the most of all the Super Smash Bros, because the characters have a lot of weight to them. So mm-hmm. it's not as floaty. And I, oh, this is the only thing that is yeah, making that's me weird nervous because about I, this game. Is it I think floaty. of Crash and I think of floaty. 
Oh, yeah, like I never really I, thought it had solid platform. No, like that's one of the reasons I didn't like the PlayStation One games was uh, I thought I they were thought floaty and heavy. weird. But we're just watching too. I mean, you don't really know until yeah, it's you hard to tell. have the controller in your hand. I try to give games the benefit of the doubt. In that also, way. it's a little unfortunate that it has thematically some similarities to what Ratchet uh, mm -hmm. Rift, Rift Apart is doing because, like, it's the time oh shifting boy. thing. Yeah. Like, I mean, Ratchet's going to just mop the floor with this. Oh, game. yeah. <laughs> like, but, like, I don't know. Like, like, life's too short. Unfortunate timing, for sure. Life's I too just... short to play this game, as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> but I do like, like the I'm, masks. Not, I'm not doing it. I, I will yeah. say the mask feature is interesting, and I think it's something that should have been done with the series a long time ago, but now that it they're doing it, I think it makes It does make sense within the confines of the IP, for sure. I mean, why not? They've had masks in the game for forever, and they never came up with the idea until now, for some reason. Um, and Naughty Dog didn't do it. They couldn't come up with it. Now that it's in another developer's hands, it's starting to have some uh, unique ideas. But it looks like a pretty stock barrel 3D platformer, but I, I'd yeah. rather have that than the old style of Crash. It does have like side-scrolling sections and the sections where you run at the screen. So I think fans, hopefully there's enough of those there to keep them happy. Um, but I think the franchise needs to move forward in this new direction. And I think if it's going to last past this thing that was created because of the revival of the old games, then it's going to have to evolve. It can't just be those old games over and over again. So I think they're making the right decision on what they're doing and the direction that they're going in for the franchise, but the proof will ultimately be in the pudding, particularly with the 3D platformer, mm -hmm. where so much is dependent upon how it actually feels to play. I mean, I would be, I would like it if, uh, if it was successful and that led to more 3D platformers like this getting made yeah, uh, with characters that I don't hate physically despise, <laughs> but like, um, you know, like I get a new like Spyro game or something like that. would be cool. Yeah. Um, it's possible. It could happen. You're right. We'll see, I mean, and like if it was, you know, it's not like I'm not open to this sort of genre. Like I tried to like ukulele. It just, yeah. Didn't it just happen. wasn't very good. I mean, that's just the bottom line. It this at least good. looks way more dynamic than anything ukulele has to offer. Like, you know, it, it, ukulele felt like it could have been made on the N64, ex with the exception of the graphical fidelity. Yeah. Whereas, like, in terms of game design, um, whereas this clearly is, yeah. Oh, yeah. you know, a modern game. Like, just watching yeah. the trailer. It's doing but stuff like, with, like, the hard drive and things like that that yeah. you couldn't even hope to pull off back then. So but you're right. Ukulele was just... Kind of a paint by the numbers 3D platformer, but it was the studio's first game. So, I, you know, second game to me will be really telling for Platonic. Yeah. Uh, we'll see what they're really made of because they've got a lot of feedback. They went through the process of making a game on their own. No excuses now. So, we'll see. Yeah. Um, but anyway, that's Crash Bandicoot 4. It's about time. Looks pretty good to me. Is it coming by the end of the year? I should have put the October. release date. Talk over October 2nd. Yeah. How crazy is they announced it and it's coming out four months later? So I could uh, I could play that or I could play Squadrons. Mm, hmm. Tough one, <laughs> even for me. Well, not a Crash tough was yelling at me outside my door. I might play Crash more, <laughs> <laughs> especially with his Corona mask. That was clever. I like that, that. was clever. Yeah, I, I mean it's nice that Toys for Bob is doing something. I mean, yeah. I was I was a little worried about them after the Skylanders thing collapsed. Yeah, but, you know, this is they're in their wheelhouse. They should be able to do a good job with it. I think. Mm-hmm. Okay, next up, <laughs> this is a story that just won't stop being updated. The release date of Cyberpunk 2077. I, I'm really starting to wonder if I have some kind of a voodoo curse placed upon me by yeah. some demon priestess because it, it's just uncanny how games that I draft in my fantasy drafts, no matter how obvious it may seem that they are going to come out the next year, it either gets completely dicey or they end up being delayed out of the year. Matt, do you think I have anything to worry about right now? I think you might. Um, I might. My, my guess is that if at all humanly possible, they will get the, this thing out on November 19th. Because I think that's probably, if not a console launch date, then the week after the second console launches. I think they did tip the hand a little bit um, on console launches. Yeah. Definitely. I mean, I think we knew where that was happening anyway, but this yeah, is a roughly. pretty good indicator. Yeah. Um, I mean, look, the, they say that the delay, this delay is due to slowdowns that they encountered in transferring to work from home because of the pandemic. And I believe that. Like, there's yeah, been a lot I of weird, weird conspiracy theories on Twitter about, like, oh, they got paid by 
Microsoft to delay it so they had a better launch lineup. I'm like, but it's also on PlayStation 5, so who gives it? Oh or because they want to sell you a, a next-gen version, but right. like the next-gen version is just an update you get for free. It doesn't free. matter which it version you buy. No, it doesn't they do anything. They all cost the same. Yeah, so... <laughs> Oh All that's nonsense. I think this is legitimately what they say. They they aren't going to be done with polish and bug squashing because they lost time to the transition to work from home. Um, will they catch up in time? Mm -hmm. Who knows? You know, like they sounds You're like they got a lot of optimization date. to do on the current gen systems. I don't that know. Date I, leaves them like forty days. Yeah. Before I don't know day. how you get. The PlayStation 4 to run this game, the vanilla PlayStation 4. I really don't either. Uh, like, the reports the are that the reports are that even on the Pro and the and the X, they're getting like 20 frames a second on this thing. Like, mm -hmm. like it's starting to feel a little perfect darky. Uh -huh. We talked about perfect like darky in 64 a while ago. Yeah, yeah. They overshot the boundaries. Yeah. I'll have you know that man on the on, when they posted this show on YouTube. People went off on us for giving any criticism to Perfect Dark. They're, <laughs> I was like, dang. They acted like you and I weren't like alive when it came out. They were like, that game got like, has like a 9.5 Metacritic and everybody loved it. When it's like, bro, you don't think we know that? Like, yeah. we, we were like working in the industry when it came out. Also, anyway. like, who gives a sh Again, the Metacritic thing is <laughs> so some, weird. It's like, the perfect dark make, defense force. Like, came argument from authority is already a fallacious argument, but it's even <laughs> more fallacious when I don't recognize the authority you're trying to argue from as an authority. I don't give a shit what game reviewers <laughs> said. <laughs> I don't either. <laughs> like, yeah. So, yeah. And, and like, all I know is that you can give it as many nine out of tens as you want, but like, my friends and I were trying to play that fucking thing at like 20 frames a second and under like and like golden i ran better than this let's just go back to that yeah so yeah. i just enjoyed golden more anyway same tangent we went off on there i just thought i'd bring it up because but it does like, remind me it's like like the reports on on the performance of current gen consoles remind me of that not and yeah. also because perfect dark is kind of cyberpunky it is actually that is a really apt comparison uh so matt what do you think the chances are that this game is actually released before the end of 2020 well then i mean i think it's like 70 percent still going to release by the end of 2020 but i you know 30 percent isn't zero <laughs> yeah and i mean if we go back about six weeks ago i would say i was uh, at a hundred percent so mm -hmm. i mean i always thought there was a chance it could slip again i didn't think it necessarily would i probably would have given you the same odds before this happened um and look they can slip it to as far as march and not lose the uh fiscal year Right. So, no, I know. I'm you're, well aware. You're right to be worried. I'm well aware. I, but I think I think room. they really do want the holiday <clears throat> sales on this thing, and I think it would be a very good attach rate, since you're not going to have people buying it for current gen in September. I think you're talking about a pretty solid launch launch console pickup option here. Like, I feel like you're going to get. Um, a lot of good sales from people buying a console and saying, hey, it, it runs better on this. It works on this by default. Like, this is how I want to experience this game. You know, I see, I've seen a ton of people on, on Twitter and forums and stuff saying like, well, now I'll play it on my PS5 because um, I don't have to wait. You know, because people are like, oh, do I want to wait and not play it for three months or do I want to like that? And now that decision has been taken out of people's hands. So I think it's going to be OK for them. But I really feel like they want this thing out alongside the console launch hype and they don't want to have to delay to next year. But if you got to delay next year, you got to delay next year. Like there's Matt, let me ask you this. Do you think it's possible that we get the PlayStation 5 and Xbox Series X versions this year and then last gen versions delayed into next year no because i think they're the same thing so you don't think that the problems that they're having getting it to run on ps4 and xbox one wouldn't be remedied by running it on ps5 and series x i mean i think it will be to some degree but like the sales numbers are on the current gen systems like you can't like you're you're cutting your revenue down to nothing by not putting it out on the systems that have 100 million install base but I mean, if they're just not done, my question really is, would you release those versions before the other versions if those versions aren't done? No, I would not. Okay. Definitely not. Because you're just you're just setting everyone who doesn't have a next-gen system up for disappointment and giving them a reason to wait until they can afford a next-gen system to buy your game. Mm. Like, I don't think you want to... Yeah, I don't think you want to put the lesser version out later. I'll it's say this. This isn't a Switch port. killer app. <laughs> it, like, to your point, 
it would be a killer app. If you had to buy a next gen console to play it, absolutely. But also, uh, I don't I think mean, that Microsoft and Sony would be very, very. I happy just don't about think it. that's a thing because I don't think they're two different SKUs. I don't think they're two different programs. Yeah. I think the thing on the disc is is the same thing. But I like, agree with that, but one is going to run better on one piece of hardware than the other. Right, but what I'm saying is I don't think you can release it separately. Like I feel like the They'd way be able to, like, I feel like the way this works. And- no, I think I think literally the way this works, and I'm sure that you could put a disc, whatever on it. But I think it's entirely feasible that the only difference is the branding on the box. And like I would definitely say that like you know when they put it out, it'll say like PS4 and PS5 on it, and like. Theoretically, if you took the disc out of the package and put it into a PS4, even if it said PS5 on the package, I bet it would still run. Yeah, I, I agree I think with you. The, I think it's the same game. Literally I agree the same with you. Game. I think 70% is about right. Um, mm-hmm. I wish it were higher. I really wish it were higher, but... I mean, it's, this would be kind of historic. Just Not only is it your first pick for the draft, it was the first pick. Oh, I know. Well, this like, has happened to me over and over, Matt. Over and over. I mean, and it was over. slated to come out in April. I know. Like it's, I know. It was I a know. safe pick in I know. January. I know. I know. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so, that's amazing. Mitch, what about you, man? What do you think the percentage is that this sucker comes out in uh, 2020? Uh, I want to say 80, and I'm going to say that. So you're a little more optimistic than us. That's good. I'm, I'm not. Yeah, I'm optimistic, but. He's young. He has for, hope in his eyes. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, for me. All this hope has not died yet. <laughs> get, having this being delayed more and more is actually worse. I think it's I think it's really bad. Um, you know, uh, obviously. For the game, you mean? For the yeah, game I think sales? Because or... we've talked about. I mean, I've talked about my experience with The Witcher 3 and mm-hmm. how broken that game was three years after it released on a PlayStation 4 Pro. Yeah. And they they use the words of we don't release games unless we think they're ready. So if a broken game is ready, I feel confident that they'll still release it, even if it's not working a hundred percent, because they have the track record. They've done to it prove before. <laughs> exactly. I mean, some of their games are almost unplayable nowadays. At launch, some At of launch. them are borderline. So yeah. um so I don't have as much confidence in CD Projekt Red as many other people do. So you're um, saying that so you I, don't have faith in their quality assurance. Do you, exactly. Do you, and you think I don't, that I don't, we think that they care more about the quality of their launch products than than yeah, they really do. Exactly. Yeah. And I don't think and and it's going to take a really good game to convince me that this is going to be a good game because I'm in my mind at the moment they're not on a pedestal. They're. They're because a of the delays, studio. you feel like you're nervous about it. I'm I'm nervous that it's going to be just as broken as the other games, and okay. I think they're going to release mm-hmm. it regardless because, according to their words, they release games when they're ready. And if a broken game is ready, <laughs> clearly that's their that's their pedigree they set. So well, I think the thing come about out. that is that The Witcher Three, The Witcher Three on PS4 did have problems, but the trick is that like. Sometimes these things you can't know until you get millions of people testing them. Yeah. Unfortunately, right, especially when a game is later, big and complex. That's my issue. Yeah. Like I understand. See, I don't know what you're Something was running into an issue, but three years later, I still had characters disappearing on a screen where I just see their swords on their back. My horse gets stuck on different areas. It was literally like doing yoga sideways on a cliff, and I couldn't get off of it. The game crashed four times on me. Like I've on my Twitter, I put every single thing I ran into an issue, and it ruined this game for me. So um, I think you're just having Shane luck with this <laughs> game. Right. I, um, I am like a bug magnet in games. I find I have played like, I have played crash. The Witcher 100 percent completion on all three platforms and never run into yeah. anything like what you're talking about. I played it on I, PS4. I've had many people reach out to me to say they but... ran into similar bugs. So I, I certainly run into bugs on it. I've fallen I into the world it. a couple. I mean, it's a huge open world game. And look how many times they've ported Skyrim and it still has all the same damn bugs. You know, like but it's, that's like the thing it's, about these, these games. Huge games just just have that as a pitfall. You know? But see, that's the thing. Thing is like because these games are so open ended and they're so gigantic, people can play them in such completely different ways. Mm-hmm. That Mitch, you will have bugs that other people will never have because you had the dagger attached with this shield and you had these certain mm-hmm. boots on. Or like you moved this like loaf of bread in this right. one cabin over here and that changed right. this. So 40 hours later, your your horse ran through a mountain. Like it's, it's yeah, I mean, that's really what it is. Things like that are re- like in big open world game. Like you never know. It's so you know, weird. Like I had bugs when I played it back when it came out, um, but they weren't like game breaking bugs. Some of them were kind of goofy and funny. Mm-hmm. Um, I have not played the game again since then, so I don't know how much has improved or not improved, but 
it was, you know, it was bug free enough that I really loved the game. I guess yeah. I can do it that I guess, way. I guess my big issue, like right away at the beginning, my first side quest I did, I ran into a bug where I can't complete it. It was telling no, me to do, do something, and <laughs> I literally could not sour do you it. On a game. And so I'm that'll... like, is this my entire experience? And it ended up being like that. So I, I, yeah, yeah, you know, I know obviously there are so many variable factors in an open world game that can break a game or bug a game out. But the fact that it's taking this long for them to try to get through bugs, I'm really, I'm, I'm just thinking in my mind right now, this is going to be another Fallout 4. Like, that's not good. Well, I, I will be stunned if this game is, is Cyberpunk is as bad as Fallout 4. Uh, <laughs> I, I, not yeah, bug wise, but just in terms of being a terrible game because I don't like Fallout 4. <laughs> um, like conversely, you know, experiences do differ and sometimes bugs can't be squashed because of how weird they are, how singular they are. Um, Witcher 3 is still my pick for best game of the entire generation. Interesting. Um, I do not play a 100 to 150 hour game three times. In the space I wouldn't of go five that far. Years. I really like it. It was my game of the year, but I wouldn't go that far. Uh, I would still go that far right now. I mean, obviously, generation's not over. It's like, close. We, got, we, We're got, almost we there. still got some stuff, and I'm sure yeah. other things will be released for current gen next year. Um, you may have just broken some hearts with your comment, knowing what game we're going to be talking about a bit later. Yeah, well, I'm not <laughs> done with that one either yet. That's true. So. That's a good point. Uh, so anyway, Cyberpunk 2077, right now, November 19th, that leaves 41, 42 days for it to come out before it won't make it to the end of 2020. I'm not alone, by the way. If you look at the Sifted Fantasy Challenge, you guys should all go check out the updates for that, by the way. Uh, we had that up in the header for a couple days last week for you guys to see where you're standing right now. But I'm not alone. Like, pretty much every single person in the Sifted Fantasy Challenge picked um, Cyberpunk. So it's, it's going to burn us on all. Their list, so, what did yeah. you say? And it was, you're right. It's like one, or one or two on their list, so they're going to get yeah. screwed like myself. Everyone's, most everyone's going to get burned by it if it doesn't make it out this year. I'm really more concerned about playing it. Like, I want to play the game. If I lose the Fantasy League to Matt, I mean... It's our happened so many times this way already. Like it doesn't matter. Although I don't know, that might be the only way. Game. That might be the only way you lose it to me. Yeah, it would take something like that. I think at this point, um, I would have to lose like my top game, and then my mm -hmm. my stand-in would have to do pretty. Is that bad. one, two, three? At least three of my games are not coming out this oh, year. Geez. So you're gonna get a zero for one. I game. think. I think Dying Light. Psychonauts 2 and Kerbal Space Program 2 are not coming out this year. I don't know, man. Um, I mean, the first one, I don't think so. But I think the other two might. I don't think so. Kerbal oh. Space Program 2 has uh, turned has some massive internal problems. Oh. I found out about So I was reading about some stuff with that, and they changed ownership or something. Like, it, it, it is a bunch of stuff that could definitely drop it out. We don't know anything about Watch Dogs Legion right now. That could be next spring, for all we know. That's one of my alternates. And then Sports Story, which I thought was a shoe-in because of it's a Nintendo release, like a golf, the Golf Story sequel. What happened to that game? Yeah, I haven't seen anything from it for a while. I don't, I don't know. know. And this is like E3 season. You think you get like a new trailer or something, right? Yeah. No. All right, let's move on. We're going to talk next about an obscure N64 franchise. Um, and it is an N64 franchise because they never released a sequel after it came out for the N64. That franchise is Pokemon Snap. It is Pokemon Snap for N64 is a, I, I don't want to call it a photography sim because it's certainly no. not a simulation. Uh, but basically, it's like, a, it's like a theme park ride. Yeah, it's got you basically ride around on a ride through these environments and snap pictures of Pokemon in their native environments, and then you yeah. get rated based upon how well it's framed and what they're doing. Like part of it is to try to figure out you know when you take the photo of them doing very specific things. Yeah. Um, like so it's like if you've ever played, if you ever been on one of those like amusement park rides, like. Uh, Buzz Lightyear's Astro Blasters or the Men in Black ride or something. Pirates like that. of the, the Caribbean. With the well, like no, well, no, because I'm talking about no, I'm talking about the ones with the with the guns. Oh, oh, like where you're using a, a zapper to shoot. So it's like that, except you have a camera instead of a gun. Yeah, it's basically what you're doing. Yeah, uh, sneaky Charlotte Sh Snake says it's a safari, which is it, technically what they do call it. You're on mm -hmm. like safari, and you're. In fact, I think that was the original title. Pokemon po Safari. Pokemon Safari. I think you may be right, it, actually. In I the think, magazines back in the day, I think I remember seeing it. I think it you're right. That. I you think that's right. exactly that, what it was. It called. was that way. Yeah. Um, so, anyway, did you guys like Pokemon Snap when it came out? I did. I liked it a lot. I did not like it a lot. I got it and I finished it. I wasn't like super thrilled day. that I paid 70 bucks for it, yeah. but I did enjoy it. I mean, because it, it lasts like three hours, I think, if I yeah, remember correctly. There's not much to it. 
Well, as and, a little um, kid that was like playing Pokemon, that that was like right when Pokemon started to get, come into my life. Like I had the old block Game Boy black and white thing and um mm-hmm. that's how i got into pokemon and pokemon snap or pokemon stadium those were the two we would switch out to when we were kids all the time it was so much fun well yeah because you could um there was like a transfer cable for the n64 where you could transfer your pokemon from the handheld version into stadium um, yes it, with your game boy color i didn't have a color, color at right. the time so i couldn't do it but yeah. my friend did and he did that um so yeah we enjoyed it hardcore it was so much yep. fun for us um snap myself i i mean i thought it was okay i thought it was a an interesting concept kind of poorly executed if that makes sense um and we have not got a sequel i mean it came out like i don't know 22 years ago maybe was it 98 it came out Mm, i don't remember i would say it was 99 yeah so it's over 20 years old we haven't got a sequel to it yet probably for a reason but i think the reason this time is that i just think nintendo's just starting to run out of ip (laughs) It's done such a good job of getting all its franchises out in the first couple of years of Switch that it's kind of run out of properties to use for new games. And so here comes new Pokemon Snap. <laughs> also, Pokemon is already proven, especially on the Switch, to be a reliable go-to. Oh, yeah. So oh, yeah. pumping out. revive I mean, anything. I mean, look how much. There's a fucking cafe game coming out. Like, what? Yeah. This, this is nonsense. They are really you know, like, starting to milk Pokemon for all it's worth. I mean, I get and it. And then they're taking I that know. milk and putting it in an espresso. They like, are. It is, <laughs> it is bizarre. But, like, yeah. I'm sure it'll work. I'm sure it'll be successful. It does. It seems like it's a, it's a license to print money. Anything they do with Pokemon just... People just gravitate towards it. At the very least, you're going to get the young crowd. I mean, that's yeah. base level. And whether it manages to snare older players like us or not, that seems to be a case-by-case basis. But the kids are all in on everything Pokemon. So um, I can't blame Nintendo for doing it, but I don't even I couldn't even keep up with it anymore. Like, there's all these little, like, indie-style games coming out, these little mobile apps. There's just... It's becoming really confusing. I'm sure Pokemaniacs are all over it. I'm not one of those people and I'm starting to get lost in the mosh a little bit. Um, but this obviously is something that's far more unique. I don't know that there was a lot of uh, fan outcry for a sequel to Pokemon Snap ever. But... I think there was a fair amount of it. Like people, yeah. it was, it, I mean, it wasn't like top of the list, but in terms of like the spinoff stuff, Pokemon Snap was pretty popular with, because part of it, I mean, I think Mitch alluded to it a little bit but like back in 99 when this thing came out and this was part of the appeal for me too and i was 23 when this game came out um it was seeing the pokemon in i mean i mean safari safari is in 3d but also in their natural habitat you know it's like it's like getting to see what they do and how big they are and kind of like you know all that was actually just getting to see pokemon for the first time in 3d really it was Um, cool you get the scale of them like how big is like a charizard versus a squirrel you have that like the animated series the anime and all that but like just seeing it i mean it was huge and doing that was cool i mean that's when it was exploding you know that's when pokemon was really just yeah becoming and like, gigantic. like you say the, the concept was good the execution was flawed but there were some cool ideas where like you could throw the balls and like cause like little um little events to happen and evolve them so you get a picture of the evolved form and like all that stuff and like if they take those you know clearly they you know, there's a lot more you can do with the tech and there's a lot more pokemon now endless endless numbers of pokemon like you could make some really cool stuff with modern tech on on this idea like i, I, mean, I think there's a lot is- of potential here it's, I mean, it's also, if I think about it, maybe really kind of the spiritual successor to this game was like Pokemon Go. Yeah, because a little bit. Mm-hmm. you're basically hunting for Pokemon instead of it being in a world that Nintendo built out of polygons, you're doing it with augmented reality in the real world. But it's kind of the same concept. Um, so maybe that was the stopgap for Nintendo until they got a proper sequel done. It's not coming till 2021. How excited are you for this, Matt? I'm like moderately excited. Like I, I like the first one, and I like um, the concept. Like you say, so as long as it's not some kind of horrible mess, like I'm in. Like I'll do it. I give, I give it like a six out of ten excitement level, maybe. <laughs> Mitch, I, I'm guessing you're a little higher. Yeah, I'll give it a seven. You know, um, yeah. and I think if this is successful, I wouldn't be surprised if, you know, kind of the trio when back then in '99 was the handheld, um, then it was Stadium, and then it was Snap. I wouldn't be surprised if we got another stadium if this does well. Hmm. You know, well, milk the property for all you got, right? 
I'll be interested to see, too, if they make use of the Switch hardware in any way. The Switch doesn't have a camera on it, but it does have motion control. Yeah, so I'm wondering the gyro if they could... controlling the camera. Right. And I'm wondering if you could do, like, one of these numbers to, like, take photos or something. I don't know. Um, we'll see. But it is a ways off still. It's not coming until next year, so we have plenty of time. Uh, my hype level is at about a 4 out of 10. <laughs> Um, I, uh, what really bothers me about the first Pokemon snap is that literally I finished it in like three hours. Um, and I paid full price for it and I felt really ripped off by the game. Uh, so I, um, I think I still feel burned 20 years later by that. And so I'm going to withhold judgment on this one a little bit and, uh, dial my enthusiasm back. And that lands me at about a four out of 10 on the hype scale for Pokemon snap. The only other thing I would just quickly say is, you know, they've been w focusing on, you know, Pokemon Go and kind of creating a pool of Pokemon in a bank you have electronically. So mm -hmm. I'm curious if that will tie into it, whether you can like transfer Pokemon from your Go to the actual Safari and take pictures there. That would be interesting mm -hmm. if they can tie Yeah, there in could be like way. a photo mode inside Snap. Um, I doubt that they would let them become a part of like... Well, they the do it with Let's Go player campaign. Well, they do it with Let's Go, so like it's, yeah, but it's possible. It's mm, you'd have to so for every scene you'd have to animate every Pokemon for every scene if you would it, do that. It may not be every do it. Pokemon. It's a lot because, of work. <laughs> I was gonna say it may not be every Pokemon. Cause in 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 Let's Go, um, Pikachu and Eevee, you can't transfer every every right. Pokemon from Go in there. Um, you yeah. do have to, there's certain kinds. So I wonder if they'll make a pool of them and to say, hey, you can transfer these ones over if you want. This game is also prime for DLC. How easy is it just to add another track to get where you jump on and take more photos? Um, this could be like a game as a service for Nintendo, in all honesty. If they played it that way, I don't think they will because then Nintendo just doesn't do that. But uh, this game is certainly prime for post-launch support if Nintendo decides that it wants to do it. All right, next up. The only reason that this topic is in here hmm, is so that our colleague and friend, great friend, Matt Kyle, can take a victory lap because he has been telling you for at least two years, two years at least, that the next game from Rocksteady was going to be a Suicide Squad game. And this week... It was confirmed by multiple sources that the next game for Rocksteady is a Suicide Squad game. So, Matt Kyle, if I, in fact, maybe Mitch, you can go into the audio bank and play a round of applause for Matthew <laughs> Kyle. We even have one of those. We do. There is an audio yeah. bank in the TriCaster, and I believe there is an applause sound effect in there that he can play to congratulate you. You were right on this all along. It's been so funny watching the coverage on all the other websites over the last couple of days where they're all like in shock that Rocksteady is doing a suicide squad game. And if you have been here on Sifted, you knew this a long time ago, years ago, that this was going to happen. Matt, you are 100% on the money. Kudos, congratulations. Take your victory lap, good sir. Thank you. I will say this. Uh, judging by the title of this thing that they've registered, which is uh, Suicide Squad Kill the Justice League, it actually sounds more interesting than what I was picturing. It does, yeah. It, does. Um, it sounds kind of Because cool. a Suicide Squad game in which you have to figure out how to kill each member of the Justice League is actually a pretty neat idea. Um, if you can't figure out how to make, like, Martian Manhunter or Flash work in their own game, make them an enemy that I have to figure out how to beat... Yeah. That's a pretty cool... That's almost a Batman game in itself. It is. Because <laughs> that's what Batman genius. does. He comes up with ways to defeat things. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, like, I'm sure it will be full of microtransactions and all this <laughs> stuff. You know, um, uh, but, uh, like, that title makes me feel... Because for a long time, I was like, I don't really care because I don't care about the Suicide Squad property. Um, I don't really either. But, like... I care about Rocksteady a lot. I do kind of care about killing the Martian Manhunter. Okay. Like, I'm, I'm kind of into that. <laughs> like, I, I feel like there's some... Inter if, like, I'm sure it won't be, but, like, uh, it'll be much simpler. But, like, but maybe not. Like, my in my head, when you say that title, I picture, like, Hitman 
except yeah. I'm trying to assassinate the Justice League. <laughs> and like, that's kind of awesome. I'm sure it won't be that, <laughs> but like, that's a pretty cool that. idea, right? <laughs> I don't know how well it would sell. Actually, it might sell pretty well. I don't think the licensors would probably let that as happen. As long as Superman looks like the Zack Snyder Superman, I will pay money to hunt him down. How about that? Think, <laughs> you put that on the box, Warner Brothers. <laughs> Uh, so anyway, Matt uh, get, was filling you in on this all along. Um, I, Matt, we, we you care to share how you knew this for so long? Um, mostly, I I had heard little things about how like um, Montreal was taking the next Batman uh -huh. um, after the uh, after the kind of because they were working on a Batman, they were working on you this. Don't have Rock to share, by the way. If you Rock didn't want it, but because I, I didn't, here's the thing, I didn't have any kind of concrete inside info or anything like okay. that. It just sounded from like chatter I heard that like they basically switched projects. And I knew I knew there was no way a Suicide Squad game wasn't going to happen. Like a Suicide Squad game had to happen for two main reasons. First, they teased it too much. But, you know, Arkham Origins and Blackgate both tease yep. a Suicide Squad game. Yep. So it's coming. Second, um, of all the properties of the DC Cinematic Universe, or DC Extended Universe, whatever you want to call it, all these horrible, horrible movies they keep making, um, the only thing to get any cultural traction was Suicide Squad. That's true. Um, it's yeah. a terrible movie, and I hate their depiction of Harley Quinn. I do too. But that Christmas, nope. not Christmas, that Halloween, um, everyone was dressed as Harley Quinn. Like mm -hmm. har that Harley Quinn penetrated the zeitgeist of the pop culture world in a way that nothing else in the DC movie canon did since the Nolan movies. So they are going to capitalize on Suicide Squad until they and Harley Quinn specifically until they come up with another thing that works as well. And they still haven't all these years later. So the Suicide Squad game had to be on. And if you're going to place that much emphasis on how important Suicide Squad is to the brand of DC stuff, I think you give it to Rocksteady because they figured Batman out. Hey, if they can Rain, figure Batman out, they can J figure this out. J.M. Rain's asking a question, and we're going to answer it in the middle of the show because he hooks up our subscribers with subs like every single week. So we're going to interrupt to answer his question. Mm -hmm. How will the potential sale of WB impact these games or will or will it? That is a really, really good question. A scary um, question, I think. And I don't think anybody knows yet. Yeah. Um, I don't even think Warner Brothers knows yet. Because um, clearly the $4 billion asking price for the, the, the Warner Brothers Interactive that AOL, what's, what's, what, who is it exactly? The parent AT company? AT&T. Um, used to be AOL. AOL Time yeah, Warner. Yeah. Um, AT the, the asking price must clearly imply the inclusion of the licenses, at least in the current development project with it. Because um, why would you pay $4 billion for these developers if they didn't come with Mortal Kombat and Batman and, you know, Harry Potter and Lord of the Rings? Like, I, I'm sure there's a lot more negotiation to go there, but, like, you can't ask $4 billion just for a bunch of developers. There has to be some value in terms of what they're making attached to that. Yeah. So my guess would be if it's a current project, Warner Brothers is still going to want the money from that because even as a licensee, they, licensor, they are going to make money off of that as a cut from owning Batman, owning Suicide Squad, et cetera. Yeah. Um, so I would think that like the 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 Court of Owls game, if that indeed is what Montreal is working on, and then from the logos they've teased, it sure looks like yeah. it. Yeah, I mean it's pretty um, pretty safe bet. Yeah, and um, and this, I feel like these are pretty safe. Uh, the Harry Potter game that leaked, and the like any Lord of the Rings projects they might have, that I don't know because they are not Warner Brothers controlled licenses. I mean, that's going to be the problem with the sale is yeah. what value is there in WB games if you don't have the IP? The WB properties, yeah. Yeah. So I, I don't know. That is a negotiation that has to occur between, you know, AT&T, uh, Warner Brothers, and whoever is interested in buying them, probably take two. Um, most you likely. Know, of, of the rumored buyers, a take two seems like the most realistic. Um, but I certainly wouldn't buy them if I didn't get Batman with it. You know, like, yeah, frankly, like, yeah. I, I don't, I wouldn't buy it if I didn't get all that IP with it. I mean, yeah. I would buy it, but it would be at a cheap price. Much, yeah, it wouldn't be for four billion. That's no for sure. way. No way. Um, I mean, that so, price has to have that IP baked into it. It just has yeah. to. And all, you know, even when you get down like Traveler's Tales with you know, the Lego license. And then the yeah. licenses for I mean, Lego that, stuff on top of the Lego license. Like, I mean, that's uh, Warner Brothers is entirely built on, on IP All licenses. built on IP. So. And it's going to be a problem with them trying to sell. And I think ultimately that's why these games are going to be okay. Is because yeah. I think the sale is just going to be really hard. And I think it's, it's going to take, take so long. This stuff's going to be done before that happens. Yeah. Yep. 
Exactly. So I think I think though those games will be okay, but the rest of it's just totally up in the air. Yeah, I think anything. Yeah, you, know, you never know, but like, you know, it feels like anything that's like slated to come out in the next year is probably going to come out. Yep. Um, but like, that's a really good question and something to keep your eye on if you're interested at all in kind of business side of things because it's a bizarre move. Like it's it and is. it's gonna it's gonna be so complicated. There must be like some. You know, there must be some patent and trademark and, and IP law firms out there just drooling over oh, the yeah. opportunity to work on this this transaction. Because oh, especially when you see four billion, and you know you get like a percentage of the yeah, sale. and it's gonna it's I mean the the contracts for this are gonna be the size of a room. Like yeah. it, it, it's I I would love to be a fly on the wall in some of these meetings, but yeah, I really really oh. something something important to ask when it comes to this stuff. But I think we'll, we'll see this, these immediate games. I think if you could compare anything, I mean, it's not the exact same situation, but when THQ went under and then mm -hmm. South Park got acquired by them, um, they didn't really change much of the game when Ubisoft took over it. I think that's kind of what would happen if, th if, that the, if that's the case. Um, but with all these extra business stuff, that's going to make it extra complicated. Didn't uh, Ubisoft already have a standing contract for that, though? No, not to my knowledge. They, I mean, they had they, they acquired had to, the they... studio. They acquired the studio, which then acquired the game at the same time. So there was a working project. I'm, I'm having problems placing it in time. Did this happen before the first South Park game came out? Yes. So before oh. the because I was following the first South Park game for a long time because I was really excited for it, and THQ went under while it was being uh, while it was being developed. So they sold off. Um, I think it was Obsidian that worked on the first one. I'm Obsidian right. made the first one. Yeah, yep. so Obsidian got sold off. And Obsidian did not get sold. Well, I mean, the property got sold. Obsidian had their name on it mm -hmm. still. So they continued to work on that project when Ubisoft bought the bought the project itself. Yeah, but like that. So there's a, there's a difference there between buying the project and buying the developer. Um, and I, you'd have to pretty much do both, but then the problem becomes if you're spending four billion, is you know Ubisoft. You better buying, get it all. Buying oh, one yeah, project, absolutely. Ubisoft buying one project <laughs> is one thing, but paying four billion dollars for the stable of developers, you're you're gonna have the deal is gonna have to include more than just the current projects under those IPs. You're going to have to have a, some kind of guarantee that you'll be able to continue to be working with these proven things under future projects, which like, if that's been done before, I don't remember it. So no, I don't think anything's done to this extent, but I think that's the closest we can get to yeah. a, some a property being bought up, and then what happened while the game was still being developed, it still came out. It just took a little longer. Yeah, it um, can be done. It's just I don't think I'm, I've never heard of anything on this scale before. Emperor Dread in chat. I think this is a common misconception when when people think about IP. He he says, "Didn't Star Wars sell for six billion? If so, four billion for Batman seems about right." And I would agree with you if they were actually getting Batman. That's not what this is. No, they're not I, buying they're not, Batman. They're not owning the Batman IP. They're owning the right to that one Batman game, basically. Or the right to make or games the right with to Batman make, in them. Right. Yeah. They don't own Batman. Which That's is something DC that Warner general, Brothers is. Well, there was something that Warner Brothers could then pull from them at any moment. Yeah. You know, that's the problem. Until it's the like contract ends. what you pay money for is not necessarily always going to have the thing that made it worth the money. Yeah. Because Warner Brothers and DC Comics will still always own Batman. Yep. And yeah, that's never going to change. So anyway, Matt Kyle. Until Marvel buys them. <laughs> Congratulations. You absolutely know that could happen. And I'm not too disappointed. You never know. Yeah. I would not be surprised. Talk about bringing the house down. That uh, would bring the house not. down. Oh, God, it's inevitable. It's going to happen eventually. One one is thriving and the other is struggling. So, And one is really good at something the other one can't seem to get out of its own way trying to do. So I think it's, it'll happen eventually. But anyway, but Matt. Then, which would be sad because DC is not the problem. Warner Brothers is. Yeah, I know. I know. So, I've heard it over and over. If you let some of the DC guys do what Marvel does, kind of form its own production company and like make them make movies based on the properties, you know, produced by people like Kevin Feige who know what makes them good and what makes them work, you could have movies from DC just as good. But Warner Brothers will never do that because they believe that comic book people cannot make movies. Yep. But anyway, congrats to Matt. He was on this a long time ago. If you watch Game Face, you knew about this a long, long time ago. So good job, buddy. Um, what's next? You got to come up with, you got to come up with another one, man. I mean, oh, like your, a Star Wars thing, thing, your Star yeah. Wars thing's pretty good. 
Yeah, I got two payoffs, like long-term prediction payoffs, like right one right at the other. I'm, bam, I'm, bam. I'm kind of out of out of juice now. That's pretty good. Uh, all right, next we're going to talk briefly about Nintendo on mobile. I don't think we've talked about Nintendo's mobile stuff for a long time. Uh, and there's a reason for that. It's because it's not really publishing a lot of mobile stuff. And, <clears throat> excuse me, the president of Nintendo of Japan in an interview... Uh, just stated that Nintendo has no plans on releasing any new mobile apps in the near future. Uh, Essentially saying that we are going to start pulling back on mobile. Um, And what was cited was the success of Animal Crossing New Horizons. So if you're Nintendo and you put out Animal Crossing, an app, uh, and it did okay, and then you put out Animal Crossing New Horizons on Switch and it explodes, what does that tell you? I mean, it tells you that maybe you were right in the first place. Remember, Nintendo never wanted to really go into mobile. It was one of these things where people just kept telling them, what are you doing? You should be doing it. Pactor was one of them. It should be a mobile. It can make so much money, blah, blah, blah. I feel like this was Nintendo saying, okay, maybe everyone else is right for once. And it turns out that they weren't because Nintendo's mobile games, they haven't done terrible, but they certainly aren't like in the upper echelon of mobile products as far as revenue driving. And if you look at the data from the last six months of uh, Nintendo's mobile initiative, all the metrics are going down. Um, Its games are struggling. Super Mario Run has struggled to generate revenue. Really, the only mobile hit that's Nintendo is I know everyone will say Pokemon Go, but that's not really Nintendo. It's a very easy thing to misconstrue. That's Niantic. Um, The only really successful uh, mobile game from Nintendo so far has been uh, Fire Emblem Heroes. Mm -hmm. Uh, And even it has started to lose steam now over the last couple months. And I would say maybe Nintendo isn't quite as good as they should be about getting new content out there. Um, But they're not abysmal at it either. Fire Fire Emblem bugs me pretty often, you know, about like new things or come get this thing. And I just dismiss it and don't, I haven't looked at that game in like a year. But uh, that is definitely the best game they've put out in terms of trying to replicate yeah, it's the most okay. mobile-friendly game. It, that's the problem. Nintendo started with the free-to-try, but then you got to buy the game. And then it quickly figured out, yeah, that's not really how mobile works. Nintendo has a habit of saying, well, that's everyone else. And we mm-hmm. can do things the way we want to do them. Um, and they had that tack when they're like, we're not getting into mobile gaming. Well, then they do get into mobile gaming, and they're still stubborn. And they're like, no, people are going to pay us for our mm-hmm. games on mobile, despite that's not how the market there works. So... They got off on the wrong foot. They, they, I think they got into a pretty good cadence with content releases. It's not as often as like some of the really big games on mobile, but I think it's often enough to keep people engaged. But the bottom line is that Nintendo is just not that good at making mobile games. Mario Kart Tour, I am a gigantic Mario Kart guy. Huge. I haven't played it my whole life. I love it. I, I love getting good at it. I, I apply myself with each new game to get good at it. I played that for literally like 10 minutes and I was like, I don't, I don't want to play it again. Like, so Nintendo has been a mess on mobile. It's been a cross section of Nintendo chasing what they think is supposed to be popular on mobile while trying to not completely uh, give up on its corporate DNA, if that makes sense. And it just mm-hmm. has just stretched itself out in a bunch of different directions and none of them are going to good places. So it sounds like uh, Nintendo's, if not just going to completely bail, going to start phasing out uh, its mobile development. Matt, do you think this is the right call, or do you think Nintendo should stick it out a lot? That's a huge market. There's a lot of potential there to make a lot of money. Yeah, but I think if this can let them concentrate more resources on Switch development, probably the better move. Better for us um, as gamers. Better for us, sure. and also I think better for them because they don't have to put things on other other people's platforms. They don't have to give Apple a cut of stuff. They don't have to, you know... Nintendo prefers to to keep things in house as much as possible, and like, you know, their corporate culture is sort of like dedicated to running on their own hardware. Like that was one of the big resistances to going mobile was they would have to run their characters on other people's hardware, which they don't like. Yeah. Um, which is a little weird because it it's is not weird. Like, it's, like, it's like a weird purity thing there, but okay. <laughs> like cheating. Um, yeah. <laughs> and uh, and look, like they never quite figured out how much things should cost on the on the the mobile stuff. And I think that's one of the things they've struggled with. The closest they got was Fire Emblem. Although even that, even that, like some of the Fire Emblem special event, like, like things, their two problems were they gave you too much stuff for free 
And then when they wanted to charge you something, it felt just a little too expensive to be an impulse purchase. Interesting. Um, at least to me. So I never really spent really any money on Fire Emblem, although I engaged with it a lot because they gave me a lot of the characters for free um, as special events would happen. But I was never quite tempted enough to spend money on like the, you know, the gotcha stuff, the gotcha boxes for more characters because they were just that much more expensive than I was willing to say, okay, fine. Um, and that's a very fine and, and, and delicate balance in like the app purchases world. Uh, and if Nintendo's not willing to sort of be cutthroat in that regard, because um, I think they were very still it's very too focused nice. on the yeah they are kind of <laughs> too nice for mobile like you there is a lot of money to be made there yeah but like I don't think Nintendo is willing to exploit its user base in the way mobile you have games to, to are get all that. about the dangling carrot it's mm -hmm. all about that carrot that's hanging out in front of your face that you can never quite get a grip on. Um, there's but Nintendo wants you to have fun playing, right? And if you're having fun playing, you aren't desiring you're not something a you'll spend gamer. money. Yeah, because like that's why so many of them are only kind of almost fun, you know? Yeah. yeah. Like Clash of Clans isn't fun. Yeah. But it feels like it should be. Yeah. And maybe if you buy that other thing, it will be. It might be. Yeah. It won't be. But but, but you're saying there's. But a your chance. brain thinks so. <laughs> it's true. I mean, it plays on all that psychology. There's yeah. no doubt about it. And you're right. I think you're right. I think Nintendo's too nice. It just. And I'm not saying they should change that. I'm just saying like their style doesn't really work in this it world. It doesn't work. And they might as well take that resource, those resources, and put them towards making more content for Switch, which you know sells really well and will make them more money anyway. No, they they made they made like the money they made off of the Animal Crossing mobile game in probably the first twenty minutes that uh, New Horizons was on sale. Mm -hmm. I'm not even exaggerating. Like they made all that money and then more by the next hour. So, um, I I don't I won't miss Nintendo if it leaves mobile. No, Is that fair. Yeah, <laughs> I haven't really liked any of its games. I've tried them all and played them all. Fire Emblem kept my interest for the longest because I think mm. it was the most similar to like the other versions of the games that I play. Super Mario Run, nothing like a Mario platformer. Uh, you study, Mario Kart Tour, nothing like a Mario Kart game. But Fire Emblem was the one that was at least kind of close. But if that goes away, I won't care. I haven't I haven't opened that app in like a year and a half. Mm -hmm. So. Um, well, it kind of wears off in a hurry, just because, yeah. especially because like one of the appeals of Fire Emblem to me are the, like the longer battles, and there aren't any of those yep. in Fire Emblem Heroes because it's just like four on four, tiny little map, and it's like a weird little hit of Fire Emblem. It's keep it simple, stupid. I mean, that's yeah. the the mantra of mobile game development: keep it simple, stupid. Because if yep. you make it too complicated, you're going to cut off like 70% of your audience. So I just don't think that mobile is the right platform for the way Nintendo likes to make games. It likes to make games that are crazy polished and really good and intricate. And that's just not really what mobile is anymore. It never yeah. has been. It's not what mobile is. So I will not shed a tear if tomorrow Nintendo's like, we're never making another mobile game. I would not care. I don't know if I'd notice. Yeah. I mean, some people would. But... Overall, like, what do you think about uh, Nintendo on mobile, Mitch? Do you have any kind of an opinion on it? I mean, I've tried it. It's it's not very compelling, to be really honest. Yeah. It's you, know, you guys nailed it on the head for every point, but I think the biggest one, Shane, is, it, as you were saying, it's, it, they don't feel as if they're the game, the property that you played it on when you played it on the console. Yeah. And that's what you want, though, when you are saying, play Fire Emblem on your phone. And when you can't do that, or you're not getting that experience, then it's just not appealing anymore. So yeah. why would I play it? So I, I, I'm with Matt as well that I won't even know if they went away from mobile. I probably I haven't played uh, a Nintendo game on mobile since Super Mario Run, and that was even like two levels, and I was like, I don't understand why this is appealing. I, it's not Mario. So Nintendo's biggest it. mistake was giving Pokemon Go to Niantic. <laughs> yeah. I still to this day have no idea what they were thinking. Like, that's just crazy. Well, Niantic. Well, they were thinking they that to... because they could just reskin uh, Ingress. Yeah, exactly. which is fine. I mean, I totally, I mean, no, I mean, like, give Niantic the bulk of, like, the money from the game is what I'm saying. Like, I'm pretty sure of... they didn't have a choice on that. Yeah, if you're I mean, using their if you're using their data and and their their entire system that they have in place with all the map and the points, 
being yeah, placed Niantic's everywhere. Yeah, Niantic's doing all they the legwork. They did leg all the legwork already on it. Yeah, so but they Niantic be- did all that legwork on Ingress, and nobody gave a crap. That shows you that it's all about the IP. So I well, mean, look, I don't think Niantic Nintendo should have got all the money. Negotiators, basically. Yeah. I'm, you're right, but I, I mean, you know, I don't think Nintendo should have got all the money, obviously, but it should have got a lot more than it than it is getting because right now it's getting a pittance for Pokemon Go. Uh, one of the that's also because like Pokemon is in their franchise. Yeah, you know, I mean, the Pokemon the company, buy, Pokemon company. Yeah, yeah. There's all kinds of weird entanglements there, but overall, I feel like Nintendo should have had a bigger piece of that pie. It deserves a bigger piece of that pie because without Nintendo, Pokemon isn't what it is, and Game Freak gets that. Pokemon Company gets that. So I don't know. Again, if they leave mobile. I won't shed a tear. I have not played anything from Nintendo on mobile that I felt was compelling or better than anything else that I played on the platform. No, that's just mobile, though, in yep. general. It is. Yep, a big pile of crap for the most part. Let's just be honest. Uh, but if you really want to play more mobile games, there's tons of them on the Switch eShop. So <laughs> that's true. That's you can have the point. privilege of paying 15 goddamn dollars for it. For a game so. that's free to play on your yeah. iPhone. Yeah, it's <laughs> it's great. But anyway, excuse me. But anyway, we have arrived at the grand finale of Game Face episode 217. I'm guessing what a lot of you guys have been waiting for us to discuss. It is time to talk about The Last of Us Part 2. One thing I want to say before we start talking about this is we are going to do our best to not spoil anything. We are going to be cognizant of spoilers The whole time we're discussing this game, and we're going to discuss it for a while, I'm guessing. However, it may may very well be impossible to not accidentally say something that a couple of you guys may feel is a spoiler. Like, some of you guys are so sensitive to spoilers that just showing you footage of the game that you haven't seen already is a spoiler. So for you guys, you're screwed. But for everyone else, we're going to do our best to keep this spoiler free. But I will say this, this game in particular is one of the hardest games ever to discuss on a show like this without spoiling something. Because the way the plot is set up, designed, paced, it's it's hard. So we're going to do our very, very best to make sure we don't spoil anything for you guys while we break down The Last of Us Part 2. The other thing I want to say before we get started is I think this game is amazing. Um, On Game Face, we do tend sometimes to really dig into games and find some faults that maybe other podcasts don't. Don't take that as as the impression that I do not like the game because I do like the game a lot. In fact, I would go so far as to say I love the game. So um, don't think that because we bring up any faults about The Last of Us Part 2 that we don't think it's great. That's not how... That's not how we do things here on Game Face. So with all that, let's talk about The Last of Us Part 2. What some people would say or have been calling Game of the Generation, certainly a Game of the Year candidate for 2020, I would say at the very least. Although you guys can let your voice be heard on that. If you've played The Last of Us Part 2, you can share your opinion on that on our poll of the week, which is in the header at sifted.net right now. Um... How do I even kick this off? I literally have, I'm not exaggerating. I wish I could show you guys my screen. Um, I have like four pages of notes on this game. That's not an exaggeration. Um, While I was sitting playing, I had notes open on my phone. Anytime something would strike my fancy, I'd write it down. And I do this all the time with pretty much every game that I tackle for a game eval or to talk about on Game Face or whatever, I do this. Um, And I would say that... Most games get a page, and I have almost four pages. Just And that just shows you the, the difference in this game from a lot of other games. Um, now, I would say this, to, to kick off the topic and maybe generate a little bit of, of sauce into the conversation, my opening statement on The Last of Us Part Two is that it's Tomb Raider with an extra four years of development. That's kind of my impression of the game overall, if I had to put it into a sentence. Um, what, how, what, how does that statement strike you, Matt? Um, I mean, I would never have thought of it myself. Um, I'm not thought of Tomb Raider at all playing this. Really? Um, no. Wow. Um, just because Tomb Raider is so much more agile and so more, much more of a ride I guess I'd say like, I see like when you say that, I see where you're coming from in the sense of like the comp that, you know, the fights are 
supposed to, you know, like Tomb Raider made an effort to make the fights feel more lethal and more like that you were under real threat as opposed to sort of mowing down mooks like in uh, Uncharted, um, which is funny because Uncharted is the, you know, naughty dog. But um, no, I wouldn't. I, and kind of like, you know, yeah, there's a girl with a backpack, you know, <laughs> so like, but like I didn't, I, I would never have made that comparison. Like, not really, no. What do you find different about the games? From what, Tomb Raider? Yeah. They don't feel remotely the same to control or play. Um, crafting is a much big, and, and inventory is a much bigger concern in, in last, or supposed to be more of a concern in Last of Us 2. That's a whole different subject. Um, the combat but crafting is, is, I thought the crafting was more intense in Tomb Raider. This is like crafting 101 in the, the last combat. Game. The combat is is frankly clunkier here, and uh, you know you're I'd not agree with that. You're not encouraged. It's to, still very visceral, up close, hand to hand, lots of stealth, bow and arrow. Just, it's just the tone. Very is so, like very organic weapons. A very simple weapon set. It's just it's, I don't find RPG it. RPG light. I don't find it out in the be, wilderness. I mean, I can go on and on about the similarities between the two games. I just don't see any. I don't, obviously I don't the think, plot's completely. I don't think it's a useful comparison because I would never compare playing Tomb Raider to playing this because I just oh, feel I like they don't would. feel the same. I absolutely would. And I think they just it's don't a feel totally the same. comparison. I think it totally is. I if if well, you can talk about that then, but I don't have a response to that. To be honest, I would never make the comparison. I don't think it's a useful one. I, I'm stunned to hear that from you, to be honest I with you. I wouldn't make the comparison either, Shane. So, I mean, I, Why? I'm, I'm the same with What's Matt. What's your perspective I, on that, I, Mitch? Well, I just understand. Matt, where, honestly, I don't feel like Matt gave me a valid reason. Well, I think I know where you're coming from, but I think because this this game is such narrative-driven uh, that uh, Tomb Raider, it, it, like Matt said, is more of a ride, and you just go with the flow here everything maybe is, maybe a better way to put it is okay what game would you compare it to then i couldn't compare what game this do you to think is game? closer to than tomb raider like other than last was one, one um right uh, i would resident say god evil? of war the only resident look i was going to mention re4 because the enemies look like they're ripped straight out of re4 but that's pretty much where the comparisons end i think i guess but like i don't find it any less apt than tomb raider like it's just more survival. It's but more can you now allow me that that is probably the closest comparison that you're going to come up with? If you're trying to tell people what it's like, it's hard to think of another game that's more like this than Tomb Raider. No. Okay, well then give me one. <laughs> like, I would just describe it as a survival horror with more vis visceral combat. Um, it's not an exact like comparison. It's also, I mean, it's sort of like uncharted with consequences like in terms of like what they're trying to push on in tonally with the violence and the and the and the combat um and like i do think the combat but just because it's naughty dog i can think the combat is most com comparable to uh uncharted especially uncharted 4 um you know especially with the addition of the dodge to this one which does make the melee combat work a lot better. Remember, um, Tomb Raider's got the pickaxe, and it's all the same stuff. It's the dodge, and then the strike with the pickaxe. Yeah, but it's you're making such a surface level comparison there. I just don't see what I'm supposed to get out of you telling me that. I feel I'm just saying that when you're trying to tell there someone are what visual, a game is like, it, people ask for comparisons. I personally cannot think of a game more closely to this game than Tomb Raider. And I've been doing it a while, and I can't think of a game that's more close to this game. I've been doing game. it a while, too, and I don't Maybe think, Red I don't Dead think you're right. Maybe Red Dead 2. So, <sighs> Red Dead 2, I mean, I've seen Red Dead 2 compared. I mean, in terms of, like, kind of presentation and to some degree tone, but... This game is so much less of a struggle to play that, like, I wouldn't say that to someone who was asking for a comparison just because I wouldn't want them to think that it was as annoying to play as Red Dead can be. You know, if that I, makes it's sense. not as annoying, but I definitely feel like there are annoyances in this game similar. There are, to there are, but like in Red Dead Redemption. 2. There are, but like Red Dead Redemption Two, I am just constantly irritated by how they have done the controls you know yeah like at oh, wait, least we should have prefaced this by how much we've all played um mitch has finished the game i am i've played about 30 hours according to mitch i'm a couple hours away from finishing and matt is pretty much right at the middle of the game yeah i'm about halfway through 
Like yeah. I, I feel I felt like I was about halfway through, and then Mitch confirmed that I am about halfway through. So, and there are people in the chat spoiling things that we had decided we were not going to talk about in the show. And that person is Sneaky Solid Snake, who has been doing that on the website the last couple of days as well. So, watch your step there, brah. Yeah, I was about to message but, him to say we're not going to talk about that. Yeah, come on, dude. So. You were doing it on the site. Now you're doing it in our chat. You're just starting to tread a little a little rough there. Anyway, um, so we've all played various amounts of it. I'm pretty much done with the game. Um, the, again, it's so hard to discuss this game without spoiling. Yeah, a lot of the stuff that, I mean, like, <laughs> uh, clearly we're going to have to do a spoiled. We are. On this. Oh, yeah. yes. Like, yeah. We, this, 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 I mean, this conversation, unfortunately, will never do the justice it deserves because uh, it is so spoiler heavy. I mean, if I could put this into words for this game, this is... I think the the best interactive storytelling I have ever experienced in my life. And I think this the story would not work if it wasn't interactive. You know, the 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 themes and what they You do a them. lot of watching. <laughs> the first like, I don't know, few hours of the game, I felt like I actually controlled it for like 15 minutes. Um, but but I yes. Other yes, than doing but, the where they just make you walk along with someone while they talk, which doesn't count. As far as actual like combat or like totally free controls, like the first few hours of the game, there's hardly any. Yeah, it but really I didn't, is I didn't notice a, I didn't notice a ton of that because I was too impressed by how what the what Jackson looked like. Yeah. Like walking I mean, yeah, walking through the town in almost any other game, I'd be like, let me get on with it. But in this, I'm just like, how? How do the first 30 minutes of this game is just Naughty Dog showing off. Yeah, like, it's gorgeous. There's, there's like, look at this vista. Look at this field. Look at this look town. Look at the snow. How it look piles up around your legs. Look, look, at, the, look at these look facial how you expressions. Can, look how you can look through the windows <laughs> of things and see inside houses. You know, like it's, or even like there was a, there was a scene early on where you're inside a house uh, doing stuff. And like at one point I pass by a window and there's just people walking back and forth and people riding horses down the street and they don't need to be there. They don't, it's just, that's, that's how complete the realization of the world is. And so That's early on, the game development, my, it? my, so my thing on that is like, you're right, but it didn't bother me, but I do wonder how I'd feel if I played it again and was like, kind of had, had to sit through it again, had, knowing um, what happens and like, how will I feel about that? I don't know. Like I, I will have to find that out later. So to but kind like, of answer your question, Matt, right now I started a second playthrough. I'm about three hours. Of course into you did. That. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I literally just started it this morning. Cause I kind of wanted to refresh my memory a bit on things and, after Mitch playing. is a machine. Yeah, I remember like, when I remember being young. I know. But it's not even <laughs> just like the amount of time. It's the the psychological part of this game. Uh, right? I mean, and we'll get we'll get to it. Yeah. Like I I have no interest in playing this game immediately after it's done. Like uh, I'll be well, glad I, to like say goodbye to it for a while. I did not play it for a couple days. So I finished it on Sunday. <laughs> I'm talking and, about like but, months, dude. No, but like, I, I know. I get days. you. And I will and I will say I had to sit down and really think. And I and this I'm still like emotionally I'm still rattled from everything that has taken place, all the the themes and um, the message that this the story has given in front of you. And uh, I just what is the message actually? I want to talk about that because I can't the, 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 because everybody seems to think that the message is violence is bad. I I have is no idea it. where that's coming from. You win from in it. this game if you use violence. That's the only way you win is if you use violence. These people. I think revenge is bad, or what people are saying. Maybe. No, is. violence is bad is what everyone has been saying. No, like, everyone's been saying revenge is re bad. That's, revenge that's is what bad. the revenge I've is bad. I've never seen the that. I don't know if I must be living in another freaking universe. Twitter, Twitter's I, been I, exploding. I feel like, I feel like Mitch this. and Matt live in one world, and I live in another. I've we never live on, seen anyone say that. We, we live on the internet, Shane. Yeah. I, so do I. <laughs> I work on the internet all day, every day. I've never seen one, seen anyone say that. I've right, heard but violence since, is bad, okay? But since I've not seen the revenge game, is bad. I've been able to explore the internet and see what the conversation really <laughs> has been about without trying to spoil the game, because obviously I played it. Um, but a lot of it is saying revenge is bad and just not understanding why a person can't let it go. And that's probably the biggest complaint. And, and it, it will stop people in that sense of not understanding the character of why they can't let revenge go. Um, but I think there's way more deeper context to that overarching uh, um, base that 
it digs deep into that I think people are missing, unfortunately. And I think that those in those inner parts is what makes this story so amazing. And the fact that uh, constantly throughout it as an interact interacting experience, there are moments I did not want to hit a button. I did not want to hit a button because I, I knew what they wanted to do and I knew why they were doing it. I may not respect the choice, but I emotionally was tied to that choice. And I don't remember another game made me not want to hit a button that many times. Um, Here's what I would say about the plot in general. Is it one, I thought it should have ended about where Matt is right now. Um, when it happened, I was really angry about it. As I kept playing, I was a little more okay with it. Um, this game did grind me down a little bit. I don't, I think it's a culmination of um, the gameplay to me gets repetitive. The environments get repetitive as beautiful as they are. Most of the game is just concrete and green vines. Um, and so, and then you're doing the same things over and over. The RPG elements are pretty light. So there's not a ton of progression. After you get to a certain point in the game, you don't really get a lot of new weapons or a lot of new abilities. Uh, and it just kind of started getting samey for me. Um, and there's a point in the middle where Matt is right now where there's like a big shift. And again, we're not going to spoil it or explain it. <clears throat> but to me, I thought the plot, if it had ended right there, it would have been perfect. Um, and then they decide to continue doing something else with the rest of the game, which I warmed up to as time went on. At first, when it started happening, I was angry, actually, that they had not ended the game at that point. So um, I think what I would say about it is that it – the overarching theme to me is that no one is good and no one is bad. Everyone is a shade of gray. There are certain parts about every person that you're going to hate. There are certain parts about every person that you're going to love. Um, and I think that's why they use that plot device that I've been talking about is they wanted to pound that point home. But for me personally, I had already got it. And I had got it like way before they even got to that point where the, the thing kind of flips. Um, I get what you're and saying I, there, but I just, I just really feel like the game's a little like bloated and I don't know. I, I could, to me, it could have been shorter. I, what I've been playing for the last, <clears throat> excuse me, like five or six hours, I have not found especially rewarding. I've found that I've stopped like getting resources. I just don't care anymore. And I'm just kind of running through the game now, trying to get to the end. Well, I found um, that like, um, the, the weird thing is like, I really like how they've changed. So, so here's the thing. I did try to play The Last of Us 1 uh, last weekend because I was like, oh, I'll play through it again. It's not that long. I'll play through it again, and I'll like, just refresh myself before the new one comes out. I haven't played it in, in so many years. So let's say I couldn't get through it. Like, I couldn't get more than... I think I got, like, four hours in, and I was just like, I don't think this is good. It is like, not aged it, particularly well. No. I, I mean, I was barely... I part. could tolerate the gameplay back when it came out. Playing it now, I just... I, it infuriated me. Like I, it was so clunky and so annoying. And it's all, you know, I, I finished the game originally just because the story dragged me through the characters, dragged me through Joel and Ellie are characters I care about and I care about their relationship and I want to see it. Um, and in fact, there is a scene in the new one between the two of the two, those two characters that I think is one of the, my favorite scenes in the history of video games. And I won't say which one it is, but it's in there. Um, and if you know anything about me, you'll know which one it is when you get to it. But, <laughs> I know um, which one it is. <laughs> yeah, yep. Mitch knows what it is. But um, this game, to me, in terms of like the gameplay, two in terms of gameplay. I mean, presentationally, obviously, we all know it's next level stuff. So was the first one at the time. Like you know, we, we, it's almost to be expected of Naughty Dog at this point. The gameplay in this game, this might be one of the most improved sequels ever. Yeah, I'd agree with that. I would agree like, 100%. Yep. Like, I don't disagree with you that I'm starting to get tired of sneaking through the same group of clickers over and over again here. But, like, I am legitimately enjoying playing this game in a way that I never did in Last of Us 1. And oh, yeah. quite frankly... I did, too, for, like, 25 hours. And yeah. then I got to the point where I was like, okay... I mean, 25 hours of anything here. is a lot. You yeah, know, like, but I've played games for 100, 100 hours or more. Sure, that I didn't get like, tired of them. There's more... You know, there are more compelling ways to play something than, than this. But, like, look, just the fact that, like, I don't have to craft for shivs sure. all the time. That, like... The one, but the well. one thing I will say, <laughs> but the one thing, yeah, well, well, the one thing I will say is like, I really like the fact that Mitch there's got a more that. open area. I, I know more about what happens in this game than I think you think I do. Oh, okay. Um, okay. The, uh, 
because I don't care about spoilers. But, um, <laughs> Did you go read all the spoiler stuff, Matt? No, but I've you seen didn't. some stuff, and I okay. can I can put two and two together. I can figure out Suicide Squad's being made two years ago. I can figure <laughs> that out. But like, uh, like the thing is, like I really like that they've kind of opened it up, and like you know, the, it's still pretty linear. Um, yeah, it's was, really linear. If there, if there mean, was one of my, you know, or, and they kind of trick you early on with an open yeah, area, and then think, that never really happens again. Yeah, in free hours and hours and hours. But, like, I do like that you can just sort of, like, even though you're on a linear path, you can sort of, if you see a building that has, like, an opening in it, you can sort of go over, and, oh, let's go through here and explore and see some stuff. You'll find you'll find a note that's incredibly depressing. You'll throw a brick through a window. You'll throw a brick through a window. You'll pick <laughs> up some ammo. It's just a gameplay you know, mechanic. It's, sort of, yeah, well, it's, it's very, so very established. that, like, <gasps> opens up the entire world that you're like, wow, why did this not happen in the first game? Yeah, I kind of like that. Like, it's like, kind of, I, it's the first you know, time to go I inside can, environments. It's an actual, no, you couldn't throw bricks through windows to open up things and stuff. Yeah, like that. It was, it was like it's such an obvious. Could, like, it, it addresses that whole thing where you're like, why don't you just smash the door? Yep, kind of thing. You know, exactly. In games like that, where you're like, why? Like or in Resident Evil, it's like, climb over the desk, you dipshit. <laughs> it's like, you're like, oh, there, I can't you know, go there's, through there's here. Stuff like that in this game too. There is some, but like, if there's walls, you should be able to climb, or fences, you should be able to climb, but you can't. They won't let you because they don't want you to. I mean, in a lot of ways, it still is kind of an older game. It is the most linear game I have played in a long time. There's no getting lost in this game. Um, uh, you can get the, lost. I think. I think I, one of the, I think after the one this most... blizzard at the beginning, I never got lost in this game again. Not. I don't even know how it's possible. I I did get lost one time uh, in Seattle. I mean, that's all I can say. Uh, yeah. When when I was when Matt was talking about exploring around and finding things. Um, I wasn't a hundred hundred percent sure if I was going in the right direction um, because oh, you just the, went the wrong direction for a little bit. Yeah, and so I eventually did find my way, but then I was like, "Oh, I need to go back because I didn't hit that other." And area you want to know, I, Mitch, why you went the wrong way for a while and didn't realize it? Why is that? Because everything looks the freaking same. No, I will <laughs> see. I, I I mean, I think that doesn't matter for what they're trying to do. This is a narrative story experience mixed in with gameplay. And I think making not, you don't have to change up the environments constantly to make something interesting. What's interesting is these characters. What's interesting is the plot. Um, what's interesting is the interaction and understanding. Yeah, I think, your mile, I think for most stuff. people that their mileage is going to vary on that because... Not everyone plays games just for the story. Not everyone plays games just for the gameplay. You know, I think so too, but I think they do change up the environments enough in regards to um, when you're actually doing the gameplay, and which I think the thing that makes this game so much better is the fact that these spaces are so wide open compared to The Last of Us Part 1. Um, well, I'll put it to you this way. It got to the point, and I'm not, not completely finished. I'm pretty much done with the game. It's to the point now where, like, when I go into a building, I'm like, ugh. Like, I like being outside where you can actually see more than, like, 30 feet away. But after you get past, like, the first act, the bulk of this game takes place inside in a dark concrete building with, like, slime on the walls and, like, vines growing on it. I mean, that's just the truth. The bulk of the game takes place in environments like that where you have to well, use your flashlight to see i um, would say it's mixed it's a it's a good mix i don't i would disagree 100 percent. i think it's inside way more than outside no i think it's about the same i think they do a good mix in regards to it may be dark outside and so it may feel like you're inside because it's night but it's 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 a good mix of inside and outside i, think I haven't, way I haven't felt i haven't felt much like it's too much inside so far, but obviously I'm. Well, not you guess because you played the beginning. So That's all out in the blizzard, and you're outside for like three hours straight. But well, I'm also 15 hours into the game. It's not like I haven't spent hours and hours in Seattle at this point either. But like, I like the fact that I can go off to one side, see an open building, go in, explore the thing, maybe solve a, a safe combination puzzle or two, and uh, come out with some more equipment. Although part of my problem is, and this might just be the problem of playing on normal difficulty, like. I feel like I can't carry enough stuff. Yeah. yeah or at the I very least, the I'm not forced to use things often enough that I need to continually craft new things and re replenish my supply of things. It's like, like there's times when I'm like, yay, I got hurt. I can use a med kit and then craft a new med kit, which means I can pick up alcohol and rags again. Because like, so yeah, the reward- I'll start of, using of, med kits if I only lost like a pixel of my health. Yeah, like the reward for there, like- And I'm like, reward. I might as well use one and pick it up. <laughs> The reward for exploring is supposed to be supplies, and if I can't carry any more supplies, 
what's the point? I mean, I don't, I'm so stealth oriented in this game. I barely fire the guns. So Me like too. even finding bullets yeah. isn't really that. Easy. But it is survival horror. Every yeah. bullet matters. Every single one. I mean, we've said that before, but in this game, it really, really applies. I mean, I mean, the other part too, I wanted to mention about the game being linear and Generally, linear games don't bother me that much. I can fight through them. But one thing I do hate about linear games, and one thing that they do a lot, and this game does it, is you walk through that one door and you can't go back. I there's, there's a This game is a big point of no return problem. Yeah. In any game where you need to pick up resources to craft or improve your character, that is BS. No game that asks you to gather resources to build your character should ever cut you off from going back and getting resources if there was like a an alert like some subliminal thing like a like a little piece of yellow tape on the corner of the door that just would be like this subconscious thing to be like if you open that door you can't go back that'd be cool that'd be good enough for me as long as i knew before i walked that door through that door there was no point of return that's fine but you don't in this game and it happens all the time i'm like crap there's a safe backup too late now like Wait, you didn't notice that like there the, most of the time it's usually a really small space and it's a door and so the door is always going to shut behind you so if you see that it's a door and it's a tight cornered space that you have to shimmy yourself through then the door is going to close behind you like that's that's what I figured no, out. There once are doors I got that you there no, there are doors that you have to like force open that right, once you get through again, they close behind a, you. But and but again, there are some that you force open and it doesn't shut behind you for good. There's no uh, rhyme or reason to no, it. Well, there is a rhyme or reason to it. I don't think reason. I I don't think I've actually been I don't think I've actually gone through a point of no return and not realize it more than once or twice. And I do explore pretty thoroughly, so I don't feel like I've really missed a whole lot. Um I just it's not even it's not that I feel like I miss things, it's that like you know, I missed the and, safe because know, of it, which is why I'm pissed any, off. Well, any safe. I went looking for the safe combination because right. usually you find them on a it's piece right of paper. right around there. So I see the safe. I'm like, okay, I'm going to go look for the piece of paper to find the safe combination. I walk through the wrong door. Door shuts behind me. Never can get the safe now. Never. Yeah. The, um, the, the, the other thing I like about the safes is that you can actually hear the correct numbers. Tumble. You, yeah. You notice that? Like yeah. you just have to figure out which order they're in. That's pretty cool. Yeah. Um, so you can actually safe crack if you're patient enough. That's neat. Um, but like the, my issue, my issue with it is, is more of an aesthetic thing. I don't feel like I, I don't think that's never happened. Nothing like that has happened to me in the game so far, but every time I go through a thing that I realize like, oh, the thing closed behind me, it just feels needless. Does that why? make sense? Why? Like, like, like it's so, so like, why can't I, I mean, sometimes I mean, if, if a big story, I mean, I know it's like a, a big story reason. event happens, like something collapses, something or you know, whatever. And like, and like, that's kind of part of the action scene. Like, okay. But like. When you make if the I'm conscious going, decision to go, if you're just going through a door and like suddenly I can't open that door again, even if it's something as simple as like, well, what if I use up a med kit and I know that there were supplies back there to, to crafting supplies back there, I could go back and get that again. But there's never a chance. That's why I get so irritated by exploring things and being too full to pick things up because I know I'm never going to be able to come back and get them again if I need them later because it's probably going to be a cutoff now, like in the I'll, near future. Matt, I'll let you know there is when you're done with the game. Um, you do have chapter selection, and on top I of that, I figured there'd be something a, like that just for so the you collectibles. You can break it down by the actual chapter, or you can break it down by the encounter. So on your second playthrough, you might be able, to, you should be able to go back if you ever like screwed up um, mm -hmm. in playing the original way. No, you can't do that, and I think that is an annoying thing for sure. Absolutely. I mean, it's How a very minor thing. How do you guys feel thing. about? Um, I, I'm sorry to interrupt. How do you guys feel about all the? Oh my God! It's it was it's so brutal. We're better than this. All that kind of discussion around this game. Are you guys seeing it? Not really. Me either. Um, it's like, have you ever watched I mean, it like is, a modern horror movie? Yeah, I mean, it is very violent, and like clearly they did a lot of in-depth research and and on how someone reacts and looks when you get their stabbed in the throat or whatever, you know, things like that. Yeah, I don't think it's as brutal as what we saw in that E3 demo last year. Um, yeah, it doesn't strike me so much. Is uh, she? Yeah. She doesn't strike them. So I mean, there's there's yeah. some tough kills in there, but like, is it beyond what I see in a lot of other like kind of violent games? Not really. I mean, yeah. there's there's more of a of a moral framework to what they're trying to portray. Like, it's not like it's not mindless violence, and I I do like that they try to put faces on the the character the enemies you're fighting. Like, 
Well, they when call you, their names. They like call their names them, out. They'll be like, like when you Alan, kill yeah. don't die. Like it Charlotte's dead terrible. and stuff like that. Um, <laughs> it's really smart to do so that. Like the, yeah, they are doing Yeah, it, it, it does work in that regard. I don't feel like, I mean, I don't feel like it's a shade beyond what we're used to in your average M-rated, like, detailed game. I mean, yeah. just because it looks so good, it's it can be probably more disturbing. And there's a lot of really great sound work. Oh, um, yeah. All the people, voice work when people yeah. die. Yeah, it's really... Really so like I get it. I understand why people are saying like, oh, it's it's brutal and it's a, it's a thing like that. But in terms of like people saying it was like over the line or it's a new yeah. frontier, if you've watched so any like I don't really really good modern horror that. movies. It's nothing. I mean, it, yeah. honestly, if you've watched some of the like more extreme horror movies, it really is nothing. Yeah, I mean, I've, I'm not that they're all horror movies, but I've watched enough Gaspar Noe that it, this is right. not some kind of like revelation to me in terms of what violence is in media. Um, and to your point, it does all have a purpose. Like even there's one scene, and again, it's so hard to talk about this without spoiling anything, but there's one scene that I'm sure that has most of the people up in arms. And I almost feel like they quit when I wanted to quit because I feel like that the the assessment that they're making is based upon that, but then it's all eventually borne out. Like I, I really don't get where this is coming from at all. Um, and again, I, I am a big horror fan. I have watched some of the most extreme horror movies in the world. I might be a little more desensitized than the average person, but I mean, on a scale of, on Shane's scale, this is at like a 6.5 or a seven. So I don't know. I, I felt like that was all overblown. I don't know if some of it was, you know, just people being like, Hey, it's a new angle. It's a different angle that I can take with my mm -hmm. review from what everyone else is writing. But also, I mean, people have different, people have different tolerances for things like that people have different thresholds and that's fine i you know i think you and i have watched a lot of violent media in our lives and aren't particularly and also you know to some degree have seen violence in real life and like there's yeah. a distinct difference well, that's another that is another things. thing i lived in philly for seven years and saw some crazy stuff with my own two eyes real stuff so that you're right i mean i am decent like i said i am desensitized more than the average person but i'm also have a pretty accurate gore scale uh, and this one's not, I don't know. I guess I was expecting something a lot different based upon. No, I mean, I think there's, you know, there's, there's some anatomical <laughs> accuracy in here. I certainly think it's, I would understand someone being more put off by the violence in this than say like the fatalities in Mortal Kombat because the like Mortal Kombat, while also very over the top and very anatomically <laughs> nuanced, yeah, so let's say, nuanced. <laughs> um, the Mortal Kombat fatalities are are, co are comic books. They're, you know, they're cartoons, basically. This yeah. is more, you know, there is def they definitely put a lot of effort in Last of Us Part Two to make you feel like even when you're taking out some random, you know, WLF soldier, you're supposed to, you're, you're, they just put a lot of effort in making you feel like you are ending a life. Yeah. Um, yeah, and for sure. that is an effective tool to kind of the other thing about it too. I mean, there's it's also because there's a great there's a like, great photo mode in this game. Yeah, uh, they put a, a photo mode where you just pause the game and go to photo mode and do whatever you want. And one of the things I would say, uh, if you haven't done it, uh, next time you stealth kill someone, particularly with Ellie, um, pause the game during the kill and go into photo mode and look at Ellie's face. No, yeah, I have. I already have. Yeah, I yeah. Have. it's it's. It's, it's amazing. Terrifying. It's amazing. <laughs> it's and one of the things I real one of the things I really like in this game, in terms of like presentation and narrative theming, is there's a big theme. Without getting specific about it, there's a big theme of these people that are capable of such horrible things, also being capable of creating beautiful things. That's kind of what and, I was saying. Like everyone's like, a shade of gray. Yeah. Yeah. And like the fact that Ellie can do what she does in terms of killing people and, and, and on this kind of roaring rampage that is, is her mission to Seattle. And at the same time can sit down and play a guitar song. Um, and there are and, definitely peaks, which is something that Joel has taught her. You know, it's like, it's like these two the horrible thing. people Everyone have passed like... these things on to each other. And like, that's a really interesting way to kind of set up where they're, where I think they're going later in the game. And that's I, the other I, thing. I, I think this like, is Neil Druckmann. I think this is Neil Druckmann's. Yeah, I think there's Neil. This is Neil Druckmann's strongest storytelling. Part. Oh yeah, I mean, look, this is probably the best story ever in a video game. I'll just say it. I hate using hyperbole, uh, but that's just the truth. As far as like an adult, mature story where the characters do what they should do, there is there aren't any moments in this game where you're like, why in the f would they do that? Like you're watching a dumb horror movie where they like go into the dark basement, like. Nothing, everything that happens in this game makes sense within the confines of the world that they presented to you, the 
the character types that are involved in each scene, the motion capture on faces in this game, like literally melted my face off. It is mm -hmm. the best I've ever seen. Again, I hate hyperbole. I try to never use it, but I'm just being honest. The nuance of the facial expressions in this is mind blowing. Like mm -hmm. it's the, I think it may be, and this is it's better than Red Dead in this regard as well. I think it mm -hmm. may be the first game I've ever played where they are able to sell deep, intricate human emotion. Seriously. Oh no, um, absolutely. That's why that's why it's so powerful of this story is because of those humans. And everything makes sense. And, Again, there's not yeah. some moment where you're like, duh, why well, would you do I, that? I, I like, will say one thing, Shane, though, but that you're I'm happy you're saying that because I think uh, going on the internet, obviously, since I played the game so I can read what people have to say, right. people's biggest complaint about this game, if they have one, is that they don't either like the choice. And so they will never get back. They will never get behind it. So they say it's a terrible story, or they can. They they say they don't understand it. And I don't know how you can not un understand what they're feeling. Uh, they don't want moments. to exactly. And I think that's <laughs> that's, that's all what's, it is. That's how powerful this story is. That um, which makes the game powerful because you are playing as these as this character. And yeah. I, I will say though, that action. as as someone who does generally prefer more interactive games, this game did wear me down after a while. Um, I feel like I still feel like it should have ended at that one point. I think it would have maybe been one of the best games ever made if it ended at that point, because to me it was just perfect. Like I'm so I happy it just, didn't. I, I, of what I know. just gotten to the point where I had started to get a little sick of some of the mechanics and things weren't like ex expanding as quickly as I had hoped. And the story looked like it was going to wrap up, and then the carpet was yanked out underneath me. And again, you know, as I played further, I understood more why they did it, and I wasn't as angry about it as I was when it first happened. But still, um, I do think the game's a little bloated. But, you know, if you're someone who doesn't have a lot of money and you're spending 60 bucks for a game, you're not going to complain about that. So, No, not at all. Um, I do want to say one thing about the sound, though. Um... I have a complaint about the sound, actually. No, I think I think the performances, I think the sound designs really well. Uh, but if you are not playing this on headphones, it's really hard to play because it is. I play so... all miss the whole thing yeah. with headphones, and, and it's amazing when it, you play it, with headphones. Absolutely, and I would recommend yeah. you play with headphones. But the issue is that it is so quiet constantly even the talking I during like the game i is, love that there's nothing and it's well, just the voices i have a note here no, that I, says I, I, so I, much I, silence so awesome it's i get it shane I, I totally get it and i agree with you on that when in headphones it works really well but when you're on what trying to do this on a sim on a tv the la the gunfire ramps up your tv's volume beyond belief to the point where i had to pause the game multiple times to the point where because i have to capture b-roll and i can't do b-roll on my headphones i have to do Wait. it while playing it on the television but um, that what, could just be your surround sound setup i like don't have a sound it's TV just a tv are... it's just the regular tv setup i went into all the settings i checked everything but once gun i haven't i'm just telling you i haven't had that problem well i i i get it but once i had the um firing of shots or explosions literally the sound decibel wise like blew up it is so the their point stereo I mix it. is bad is what you're saying exactly. i don't think i don't think so i think that sounds more of a uh, dynamic range problem um which this they sounds have, great they have very spe so i have not used headphones on this because i don't play games with headphones i have a very extensive surround sound setup so i don't have to use headphones um and it sounds great like sounds no problem. Everything's bouncing yeah, it around. Sounds properly. great. On Everything's too. around. Yeah. Um, it's like the, amazing. The, the, honestly, it's really honestly good. <laughs> the the only the only sound issue is that the PlayStation Pro is so loud. The um, fans, yeah. The fans, the fans. This thing turns into a jet engine. This, ga this game turns totally this okay. into a jet engine. Um, <laughs> totally okay but uh, which is but it's far enough away from me that I really only notice it when I, I pause it. But I definitely understand when if if you're sitting closer to the TV. And don't, maybe don't have as good as like yeah headphones are the even headphones even if the sound mix wasn't so designed for headphones um, just so you don't have to listen to your damn fans scream at you for the <laughs> yeah. entire game um, but like uh, it is possible that the dynamic range is off because you know I don't think sometimes I think you don't they don't test these things on uh, you know on a toaster as you would say. Um, that that was always one of the things on some one of the old like the old uh, some of the better sound mixers I know. Like they do the sound mix, they do the surround mix, they do the big thing, they do all the stuff. And then one of their tests 
is they play it on like a mono CRT. Yeah, you have to. You know, it's just like, like just, when you like, make an album, you play it through like an eight track player to see if yeah. it sounds good, like or on a cassette. Like you have to play. But it I know, but I do know uh, game game sound people who like complain that they don't have the option to do that because because you build this super high tech sound studio in your dev dev station your dev studio, and yeah. then you never think to put the lo fi option in for testing. Yeah. Yeah, um, I just know on my system it sounds freaking amazing. No, it sounds like, sounds great. I, I haven't incredible. I haven't had a problem with with gun. I mean, gunshots are loud. They are loud. It scared be. the living crap out of my wife because because of what Mitch says. Like it'll be really quiet. Like I yeah. love how some of the cutscenes have no background audio at all. It's mm -hmm. literally just their voices. Like games never do that anymore. Like you you'll hear at least like a bird chirping or something. But the the cutscenes that happen inside, it's like dead silence and what will happen is like i'll be playing the game's really quiet for a really really long time because there'll be a cutscene going on i'll open the door like a clicker or something will come right at me and i'll fire that shotgun once and just go boom it just lights up the whole living room it has been my wife by the way has sat and watched me play pretty much this whole game and she loves it she would never play it she would never touch it and she hates a lot of the violence in it but she loves it. Like she started asking me, like she would go to bed and I would keep playing and she'd be like, so what happened? Like after I went to bed, like I, that just shows you that the, the storytelling in this game really, it really is another level. Um, I have not seen my wife respond to a game like that literally in probably like five years. I'm not exaggerating. And she watches me play almost all of them and she just tunes them out. Not this one. Like she started like laughing at the jokes and like, she started asking me questions about, so who's that? And like, how do they relate to this? Uh, she's never done that before. And I think that's a testament to the story, the writing, the voice acting, the facial animation, all of it. It just all congeals together to make it awesome. I, I don't know how else to put it. Um, it really is that good is what I'm getting at. It really is the last of us. <laughs> um, but again, like I have a list of stuff here, like, you know, issues that I have with like the gameplay. Like the one thing I would say is that was surprising to me is that this uh, this game is like kind of just a grind. It just kind of stays at this one level with kind of little blips and spikes here and there. It, it's a naughty dog game, but there really aren't any like crazy set piece moments. There's really only like one or two like legitimate boss fights. Like they try to make boss fights out of, hey, here's this new enemy, fight just one of them the first time. Uh, so, but there aren't like these crazy over the top bosses that are the size of a house and they're throwing like trees at you. Like it's, it just kind of stays on this even keel, which to me is way out of the ordinary for Naughty Dog. And in all honesty, for video games in general, most games are like spike low, spike low. That's and this one just kind of has- part one was like though. Actually it's this shirt that I'm wearing right now is a perfect representation of The Last of Us Part Two. Oh, if you can see it. Hold on, give me two seconds. Uh, okay. Can you see it? Last, the Last of Us Part Two is a pulsar. <laughs> yes, it is. In fact, that's exactly the vibe of playing The Last of Us Part Two. Little little uh, blips and dives, but generally staying on the same even line. Um, I don't know. I mean, again, I have like tons of notes. I could start going through a lot of this stuff. Um, how do you guys about feel melee? about? What do, you, what do you think about? We haven't really talked about melee that much. I think it's good. Um, I think it's great, greatly improved. Oh yeah. I mean, all the gameplay was vastly improved. I think. Like the my big problem with the first game was the whole uh, do Ellie running out in the middle of like mm -hmm. enemies while you're in stealth. Like all that stuff has been fixed. Like well, for I've the seen, most part, I've seen most. I mean, it happens way less often. Oh, yeah. but there have been a couple times when my my buddy was. We'll Stand jump it right up on top of, of a box, like, yeah. yeah, it still it's happens, but it's, better they're much better. Like ninety-five percent improvement. They have yeah. like they tighten the person to be closer to you, but I think the issue I ran into is actually I got stuck in between a wall and the person because I that, had, I that ran had happened to, to me a couple times. I ran it was a couple times. Like, I had, like, get a out of the way! Of like, I got to yeah. do the work. And then the yeah. worst part was I had actually re thank God the checkpoints are very forgivable. Um, I had to go back to a checkpoint because literally it was waiting for me to be in a certain position so the character could move. And so I couldn't jump. I couldn't mm -hmm. crawl out of the way. But, um, but yeah, I do like the companion. It, uh, when, they, when you do have one, it is vastly improved compared to the next one. And I think the other big thing with having the open environment of w wider open um, is 
you know, tight quarters is not this game's bread and butter. And yeah, so it gets you awkward have, whenever so, enemies get close. Exactly. So now you have the space to actually run away and have some good amount of distance to be able to reestablish um, killing them from from farther away instead of being up close and personal. Oh, this this game has got my heart racing so many times. Like literally, to where you like run away and you get behind cover, and literally, I'll be like, "Holy crap!" My heart feels like it's about to explode. Like it just happened over and over and over in this game. They do a very good job of terrifying me. Um, and and Mitch is right. It takes a little while, at least it did for me, to understand that you should run away. That it's not like this coward tactic, or you're like breaking the game. The game is designed for you to run away because the enemies never lose track of you. And that is a little goofy, I'll admit, because there are times where you'll fight like a human enemy, like 150 yards away. You'll run away, you'll go through like five corridors and then hide behind a box and they'll walk straight to you. So there uh, are some I contrivances. Would, I would I would say they don't walk straight to you. I think they get in the vicinity of where you're around. And then if you don't, like if you're not constantly no, moving, I've seen they enemies definitely you. track me down. I've not Literally seen one that has down. actually like found my that exact shouldn't location. have been able to track me down. I've seen one like go to the the room next door to me, but not in the exact I room have. I was in. I, I have seen it many times. Um, I haven't had and, that problem. They 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 they're pretty realistic about. They know the sound came from a certain area, but like I have shot a guy like in in a room and then gone to the next room and hid behind the door and like my plan being like. If they come in this room, I'm just going to like grab the guy and, and grab the guy, hold him hostage, shoot the others, stab him in the neck. And they looked around and they uh, they, they never opened the door. They, they some you know, it, 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 Once they get dogs, it becomes a whole different ball game. Yep. But I felt like they play the, the zombies don't play fair. The zombies know where you are like instantly yeah, for some reason, for sure, uh, unless you run away far enough. Um, and then the clickers yeah, I've had problems with track. like clickers like I'm literally crouched haven't moved and they just run right at me. It's like, I didn't make a sound and they, for whatever reason, they I did have that happen last night. Um, when I was high, I was hiding from a clicker behind like a little like table and like he, it just turned and saw me. Yeah. And like it just saw me. And I'm, I was like, they don't is have it, eyes. <laughs> right. I'm like, is it because I was yeah. like behind a table? Cause the table wasn't solid. It was, a, you know, it just, I was behind a table is, you know, it's open. Like you could see me if you looked at the table, but the uh -huh. clickers don't have eyes. So they shouldn't be able to see and you can approach a clicker stealthily from the front. Cause they yeah. can't see you. Yeah. You right? should be able to walk. And right it just, up it just looked can. right at me. Dude, I, was and, and, and run, right. I know it's happened to me a bunch but, of times. But did it do it? Like liquor. Uh, did it do it's like call? Cause I no, like if you're, just, if you're it just standing turned, near it, it, just while kind of, it does its echo sound. No, I know. I know how clickers pop. work. I know. I know how clickers work. I've played the game a long time. Yeah. They do their big scream to bounce. Sound um, off. yeah, they do echolocation, but this one just like looked right at me. And I thought I would, I thought I was safe cause, uh, they can't see me. But yeah. uh, that's the only time that's happened. But like, um, other, I mean, ninety-five percent of the time it works fine, um, and I feel like it plays more or less fair with things. And I felt like, I felt like that wasn't necessarily true of the first game. Like the first game felt very frustrating. The other thing, I, as Mitch says, like the checkpointing is extremely generous. Um, you know, yep. it pretty Even much like checkpoints every single time you kill something. Like if you can yes. always jump back to the last time you before you screwed up, and if you want to restart the whole encounter, that's like I've never it lost more than like, like a minute of yeah. Game time. It like, literally takes like two seconds to reload too, which is yes, nice. that is like, also really good. The initial load is really long, but once the initial load happens, like there's hardly any loading in the rest of the game. Um, yeah. As far as like going from room to room and stuff like that. So I, I will say the difficulty does ramp up near the later half of the game uh later yeah i'm already third. there um but i um but i will say uh a testament to the game is i was able to in two certain encounters near the end where there's probably 20 20 guys maybe more than that i was somehow able to get by them and i had such satisfaction in it that you mean you stealth past them? Yeah, without stealth them past you? them. And I, I was surprised I was able to do so. Like I tried a, a crazy strategy and it ended up working. Um, but it's just a testament to the game as a stealth game compared to the last mm -hmm. one where I don't think I would have been able to get past them. No, definitely not. Would, this it's one a very different is definitely thing. a way better stealth game in every way possible. The uh, I, I, have, I have run into a couple of things where like, you know, there were 20 or so WLF guys running around. And I got to one of those a couple of days ago, and I killed every single one of them. Yeah, you just and pick them off was, on the edges, work to the center. Oh, no, I stabbed them all in the neck. 
Well, yeah. Except, except the except the, yeah. the, the dog. But you go around but the edges, you take them off, and no. then spiral to the center where they all are until no. you have one left. No, I couldn't do that because they all showed up while I was in the house. They were oh, surrounding me. Oh, so okay. I had to kind of lure them in, kill them here, take the dog out. Use the, killing, killing a dog with a silenced pistol was like a good way to lure them to a certain place. But they, no one ever saw me. No one ever knew where I was. Like, I killed them all, walked out, and I came out of that thinking, like, I would never have pulled that off in the first game. Like, they, <laughs> yeah. they improved this, like, oh, all this around. Oh, this game is a improvement on pretty much every front. Yeah, I can't think of any way this game is worse than the last one. Not at all. Yeah, for no. It's not like the first game was a slouch in a lot of other places. You know, yeah, I didn't yeah. like the yeah, gameplay sure. much. But even, here's one of my favorite, like, little touches in the game. Um, which is just like such a naughty There's dog a thing. lot. There's yeah. a lot. But like the thing that I, I, I still enjoy 15 hours in is when you open a drawer, uh, if there's something in it, you can like hit the you hit triangle again to pick it up. And if you if you let the let her open the door and put her hand down, she'll just reach in and pick the thing out of the drawer. If you press this triangle button before she's done opening the drawer, she'll just reach into the drawer with her other hand and pick it up completely naturally before the drawer animation's done. Yeah. And it's the most like natural human thing ever, but all of nobody all does that even, in games. It's even so, the gun it's crafting. So the gun, when you craft the gun and she actually does yeah. this little like goofy animation where she's trying to like she actually build the new part. Do the animation of that is insane. And yeah. then how quickly she like buttons everything up and then hits the power strip and off you go. Like it's just, the whole game like, is just slick mm -hmm. like that. There's it's just, detail. and there's little moments yeah. where like, you know, putting the backpacks on and off, taking jackets on and all, like things that like we know from like knowing game devs and knowing games forever that like, those are just things that they're are hard to do. They, yeah. they, no one notices and they're super easy because no one thinks twice about putting a jacket on in like a movie, but you want a character to do that. You are changing the mesh and it's a very difficult thing to do. And Naughty Dog just does it periodically in this game. I think just to that's show the they seven can. years, though, man. I mean, that's what you're seeing is you're yeah. seeing that extra time that they have that other studios don't have to do this stuff. And that's why we love their games. and We can't wait for them. And that's also why we won't play another one for like almost another decade. So it's a trade off. You know, that's why I called it like Tomb Raider with an extra four years of development. You know, it's like Tomb Raider takes three years. If it, you gave it another four years, you can put crazy stuff like this in the game. Uh, that doesn't. Anything, I'm not trying. Really. Yeah. We'll, I mean, I'm not we'll, trying to diminish the skill of Naughty Dog. Obviously, they're very skilled. But Cyberpunk got eight years. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, but that's that's kind of how it works. It's like if you're going to make a game like this, you need at least five years. I mean, that's just yeah. all there is to it. So. I mean, luckily, um, Naughty Dog's in a position that they can do that because yep. they're owned by Sony. They're a flagship company developer for Sony. They make prestige titles that make Sony's platforms look really good and desirable. So you yep. know. That's like, you know, I know we talk about how exclusives are not great because they, they lock things into one thing, but like, and I'm not a fan of like paying third parties money to keep your timed exclusive thing on, on one platform because it limits things. But like, I really do like the prestige, you know, in prestige exclusive title from in-house stuff. And but I, I think also Sony saying does that better. They than haven't anyone. spent seven years on this. They have, they started on this a year before the, the first game came out just because they released uncharted. Doesn't mean that they weren't working on this and uncharted at the same time. Yeah. They have two teams. Look at Neil Druckmann's tweet. The day, the minute the game released, the first thing he said was after seven years, hallelujah. <laughs> People in the chat. So, I mean, seven years includes pre-production and design. You know, it's not like yeah. everyone, it's not like everyone was coding for seven years, but like that all counts. Planning matters. It so, does. Yep. And this studio, I'm I'm guessing at this point, is probably pretty darn good at pretty it. Final, it, it. Yeah, finely tuned machine, I would think. And it still takes them seven years to make a game like yeah. this. Was it worth it? That's the question. I mean, I would, would you be happy would say playing so. this game a little bit of a lesser product like three years ago? I mean, not three years ago, but like I like a lesser like a lesser I mean, what would that even be? I mean, a lesser product Tomb Raider. <laughs> I mean, that's really what I it just, is. I still just don't see that comparison as useful um but like just a less polished version of this game is still going to be better than most other games right so, so, like, was, it, so was the extra three years worth it like i think if you can take that long sure sony, like i don't know about financial perspective i guess if you're if you're looking at it i don't know if sony looks at a financial perspective of this thing i mean I, it looks like it's other selling than, like crazy oh yeah um, it's gonna sell a lot look a lot. The, uh was saturday night there were 28 people on my PlayStation friends list playing this simultaneously. And I've never seen that many. Mine was 23. I had 23 people playing the same game. That is, that hasn't happened since like Halo three. Yeah. It's, well, it's I mean, when not, it does not than, happen now when it sells more than animal crossing. I mean, it, during a pandemic, that means yeah. something. Um, How do you guys feel about playing this game during these crazy times? Because I do wonder if, like, I was mentioning how the game kind of ground me down after a while. And I'm sure part of it is this 
crazy environment that we're living in and how kind of depressing things are right now. Did it, do you guys feel like it impacted uh, your play of it at all? I mean, it felt like a timely in some ways. I, I do have a couple of friends who are not playing it right now because they don't, they aren't in the headspace to handle a post-apocalyptic violent, like bring an apocalypse. Thing. <laughs> um, and I get that. Like, you know, I, I you know, I, I, it's, yeah, I don't know. Like it, it didn't, it, there's no zombies right now. You know, it's not, it's not as exciting, I guess. It, it, in some ways it would <laughs> almost be like preferable to have an enemy you can see. That's a good point. Um, actually. <laughs> I think, I, keep, I, did, I think about it the most, I think about it the most when the, I think about it the most when I get when we get to sections where they're like, oh, there's spores in that room. Put your mask on. It's like if only it was that simple. Yeah, right? wouldn't it be nice? <laughs> uh, I think I think if anything, I think it just created a perception, uh, um, perspective of you know seeing these shops empty. Like I walked by in Los Angeles and seen shops empty, and mm-hmm. I think it I think mm-hmm. it only helped the narrative. Um, and I, I I mean I think it. Yeah, I think it only helped the narrative in that aspect for me. I don't think it... Well, it definitely makes it more impactful. That wasn't yeah. the question. The question was, tone, did the it make it harder it itself, to play? I, yeah, I know. I think the tone itself, I don't think it affected me in regards to like not enjoying this game more or wanting to enjoy this game more or less. But you played the whole thing in like 20 hours, so I guess not. <laughs> yeah, I think I think we answered... I think he answered that question with yeah. actions. Yeah, yeah. I, think we, I, mean, yeah, and I doing didn't even really need to ask him that. Too, so, you know. <laughs> I mean, it did not make it harder for me to play. I just... You know, uh, but I'm I good will, at compartmentalizing. But I will make anyway. Out, I but, forgot we talked when we talked about the difficulty. If you've played The Last of Us Part One and you were fine with it at the normal difficulty, I would recommend playing on hard. To be honest. Well, I, I, actually, okay. So as I said, I have tons of notes from my playtime of the game, Sorry. and I can and they're in chronological order, so I can see kind of how my opinion was shaped over time. So about two thirds of the way down page one, I have like game is way too easy. Um, like another page and a half down game be, has become way too easy. And then now that I've, I'm at the home stretch of the game, it's got to the point where it's kind of perfect. Um, so I would say the first two thirds of the game are pretty much a cakewalk. You'll die here and there because every once in a while, you'll just get like trapped in a corner by the infected or whatever. There's really no way to avoid not dying at all. But for the most part, it's pretty much easy street until you get to the last third. So I don't know, though. I would say this, like the the last couple sections of the game I've played have been pretty freaking hard. So I don't know if I would want to play those sections if, if they were harder than they are right now. So I guess I would say the balancing is kind of good, I think, for a casual player. I think it's much easier than the first game. Um, I would agree with I've, that, too. I found the first game to be a little irritatingly difficult early on, and then once you get more equipment by, like, the halfway point, it becomes about right. Mm-hmm. Uh, this feels very easy, and there's a couple places that are, like, we're, we're a challenge, but it was more of a challenge to do it the way I wanted to do it. Like, rather, if I, if I wanted to get through to it, I could have gotten it. through it, you know? Yeah. like I, Sometimes the game does have a way that it wants you to do things, and if you try to do it another way, you probably can, but it's mm-hmm. going to be a pain in the butt. I mean, Uncharted has that too. It does. Uh, yeah. Uncharted Four and Lost Legacy definitely had that, and I think worse than this. Yeah. Um, because you have so few options of how to do things in Uncharted compared to this. Like there, you know, with Uncharted, it's like if you do the wrong thing, they're just going to shoot you and you die because you can't find somewhere to hide. Uh, this is more like, oh, this is going to be a lot harder if that's how you want to go about it. Um, but uh, I find I find that the the, the, the I, I would probably say yeah play it on hard. Uh, I kind of wish I had played it on hard because I feel like I would be going through my equipment more quickly and exploring things and finding supplies would be more rewarding. That was my um, thought too, Matt. I, I by like when I hit that harder part, I was like maybe I should have played this on hard because even though it was ramped up, I thought it was not as difficult as I was thinking it would be in regards to how far I progressed mm-hmm. and how much yeah. I've upgraded my my gear and my weapons and all that kind of stuff. So I yeah, did the first regret. two thirds. It's like a, the first third of the game is almost like a walking simulator. I mean, it's just a lot of walking and talking and yeah, it's teaching you stuff more than anything else. Yeah, really. and then even like that second half of the first third, it's still just a cakewalk. Even the second third of it, like I really 
I don't remember dying like without it being some fluke where yeah, I, I don't got overwhelmed or like people talk about how oh I can only play so much of this because it's so intense and I just haven't gotten that from the gameplay. I get it from the narrative. Like the narrative is like oh my god, it just won't let up. Like every mm -hmm. time something you think something's going to be solved, it just gets worse for everybody. Um, but like the actual gameplay has not been. Tremendously a tremendous strain on my nerves, I guess I would say. Like My heart gets going, definitely. Whenever they're chasing after me, I, my heart definitely gets racing, for sure. I like it, though. That's why I play. I love mm -hmm. stuff like that. We probably should wrap it up. Uh, I still have so much more to say about this game. I'm sure you guys do, too. Um, I figure it I won't mean, be the last time we talk about it. I mean, uh, definitely not. But, I mean, I think that's a testament to the quality of the game. Um, and if you're all wondering, obviously, three thumbs up from all of us. Um, I... <laughs> Like, I am really shocked at some of the, like, low review scores. Like, how did you rationalize giving a game with that kind of craftsmanship that kind of score? Like, I get it. You may not like the story. You may not like whatever message you perceive it to be sending out. But, dude, <laughs> some of those scores, I mean, I don't know. Some of them do it for clickbait. I don't know. But the game's great. I All of biggest, us are going to recommend you buy it. The uh, biggest people's reason is they say because of those elements, Shane, it's no longer fun. And they want this game to be fun. And I don't know. I think because of what elements it's not fun? You know, the, the story, the, the plot. Oh. Uh, um, and then the thing that you talked about, the plot device, they consider that no longer the game being fun anymore. And no, I don't that's think that's the point. Close my like, stupid people. <laughs> well, that's what Neil Druckmann said when he first, when this game was coming out, he said, this game is not going to be fun. He doesn't expect it to be fun. Um, because I've had fun with it, though. Like The writing is great. There's like little jokes here and there. Yeah, and I think because, fun. because there's a contrast, yeah, I, because the other stuff is so dark, you get just a little joke, and you're like, oh, my gosh, that's hilarious. Like It's so funny how this game like manipulates your emotions. It's awesome. It's sure, I, I also just think like it doesn't have it to be super fun. Like, yeah, like games, yeah. and not just games, they movies and TV shows. Just because I didn't have a rollicking great time watching a good movie doesn't mean it wasn't a good movie or that I didn't get anything worthwhile out of it. Exactly. And if you want games to be, you know, taken seriously as an artistic medium, there's going to have to be a few of those. Like some yeah. of this game feels to me like a dare from Naughty Dog almost that says like, hey, this is what we think AAA games should be now and what they should be about and who should be in them. That's and like, the part of you, it that reminds me of Red Dead 2. If you can't handle that, maybe this isn't for you anymore. Yeah. I and like, like I dig that. I, th I think uh, I think they're pushing. They're you know, challenging they're, people. They're challenging, trying to challenge you, and some people are not ready to be challenged. Um, nope. And I think, you know, the reaction to this game is similar to what we saw from another uh, entertainment product that tr challenged people in a way they weren't ready for, which is called The Last Jedi. Yeah. And uh, the crazy I, part I see a lot this, of similarities there. The crazy part about this is I avoided all those leaks, but I, you know, you couldn't avoid comments here and there from people on social media or whatever and seeing people being like, the story is blah, blah, blah. Like, I, now I really can't understand all the people who were freaking out about the leaks. Like, they are really just idiots. That's really what it comes down to. I was given the benefit of the doubt. I'm like, okay, you know something, I don't. So you might be right. They, oh, they, they were no. so freaking they, wrong. They definitely don't know anything. They're idiots. They're, yeah. they're seeing things people. through a very different lens than the rest of us. And yeah. uh, that seemed pretty obvious to me from the beginning. But playing the game. I try to give people the that. benefit of the doubt. But they were wrong. Dead, dead wrong. So that's it for discussion one on The Last of Us Part 2. We are recording a spoiled for this um, where we will talk about the plot in depth. Guys, I'm pretty proud about how we did the discussion. Like, we really, I don't think we spoiled anything. No, I think we did a great job. I don't job. think so. Yeah, I think we handled it okay. So I hope you guys feel the same way. We were very cognizant of that. We wanted to make sure we took care of you guys discussing this game because we know a lot of you haven't got through it. You may have, actually have a life and didn't get to plow through the game like uh, we've been doing. So uh, great discussion, guys. And it's time for Q&A. People have already sensed the, the shift in tone of my voice and have already got the questions into the chat. Uh, here's one from Mark Simpson, UK. Uh, the question came up earlier about thoughts on Naughty Dog's embargoes. Um, so if you guys aren't aware, Naughty Dog sent out pre-release code to like the biggest outlets and then had a very stringent list of things that they were or were not allowed to discuss. And they were 
they were on the extreme end of things. We've been getting these for decades, um, but the Capcom list, does stuff like that a lot. Yeah, but it was very specific, and they'll be like, "Don't show this scene. Don't show this scene." Normally, Nintendo is one of the only publishers that really does that anymore. But Naughty Dog was kind of heavy-handed mm -hmm. with it, so that's what Mark is asking about. Um, I would just say, if you want to review the game a week before it comes out, you're going to jump through the freaking hoops. If you don't want to jump through the hoops. You put up your review and the embargo breaks. Very simple. I mean, I think the only thing you could counter it with would be, you know, make two reviews. Like one that is pre those things. And then yeah. once the game comes this out is, and everybody mm -hmm. has it, you can have your actual like, I think a couple of publications actually have done this where they have some sequences with the same writing. Yeah, they call it like their pre-review or pre review, review in progress yeah. or whatever. Basically what they're doing with those a lot of times is just being slimy. They're... They're trying to put up their review and get the traffic from the review without actually finishing the game and writing the review. Um, so as an editorial guy, I have issues with some of that stuff that they're doing in, in that way. But um, again, it's a, it's not your right to be able to put up the review for The Last of Us Part Two a week before the game comes out. It's just not. It's a privilege that you're being awarded by the publisher. That's all there is to it. So if you don't- And I don't think they're hiding anything. No, you know, it's like, that's not- They're it's, not ashamed of the game. They're not trying to trick anyone from- But you know what, that, that's probably game. exactly where people went first. Of course it is. Oh, that's absolutely where they went. They don't want what are they hiding? Something that's bad. Yeah. No, it's just they don't want to ruin the experience for yeah, the Yeah, they want to preserve this, the experience for this people. Has, <laughs> it, this, is, this is a crazy uh, experience, and you don't want to oh, mess man. that up for somebody just because people a reviewer decided to either mention it or show it on a screen. Like, And uh, you would, too, if you spent seven years making something. Right. I think I reached a point where my bullshit filter is so acute <laughs> that I just can't <laughs> tolerate it anymore. Uh, anyway, uh, let's get to another question. Uh, Commander Fett, do you think the sales of the new Harry Potter game will be impacted by the recent J.K. Rowling controversy? Well, that's a good one, too. So, uh, again, Cribno's version of what happened. J.K. Rowling made some comments about trans people that the trans community is not happy with. That's mm. the quickest way to sum it up. Um, and so what has been making those comments for a very long time. Yeah, it's um, not a new stance for her, really. I mean, I, so I've been uh, keeping an eye on this uh, in part because I have a couple of younger friends who are huge Harry, you know, grew up with Harry Potter people, but are also very dedicated to, uh, you know, trans rights and, and that kind of thing. And I agree with them. And one of them is, in fact, trans. So uh, he is having an extra hard time. <laughs> but like. I mean, there's a part, of, there's a point at which you have to make that decision. Like, are you go? If the creator is a terrible person, can you separate the art from the artist, or are you not okay doing with that? Doing that, and that is something that everybody has to decide for themselves. Um, so far, the people I know have decided I am still going to love Harry Potter, um, except I'm going to pretend it came from space. So they're going <laughs> to separate know? the art from the artist. They're going to try to separate it because, like you, you know, it's, it'd be like if George Lucas turned out to be horrible. It turned out to be a racist Nazi. Yeah, and yeah, exactly. And like, I can't. You know, what, do I? Can I stop liking Star Wars? Star Wars is very just, hard. It's hard. It's like but Michael Jackson. Have, right. It's, like, there's the best example. But you can also, ex I sort of, but like, I also, I feel like Michael Jackson is a, is a more concentrated idea because his music is still his music. I would argue that while J.K. Rowling has a lot of influence over what happens with Harry Potter, Harry Potter has become much bigger than just her. That's true. You know, there's yep. so you know the, the movies are made by elite armies of people, and the game will be made by an army of different people, and and there's so much more to Harry Potter now than just what came out of her head. That I think, um, especially years from now, if the, if this game even still comes out, because who knows what the sale thing happened, all this stuff. I feel like it's uh, the majority of fans. Uh, adult and younger will be able to say like I still want to play this um, and it's it's I don't I don't feel like I am betraying myself by doing that um, but you never know God knows what she's going to do next week you know like it could get worse and worse I'm sure that Warner Brothers is having a lot of problems with the idea that she's so closely attached not just to the game but to the next uh, 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 Fantastic, Fantastic Beast movie yep. Yep. Um, you know this is going to be an ongoing conversation both between inside of the fandom and inside corporate world the corporate world that doesn't want to have her and her stupid opinions attached to things that they want to appeal to literally everybody so it's going to be I, I don't. I think it's too early to tell because that game is years out. But it will definitely be part of the conversation going forward. With I it. think it will definitely impact sales, but I don't think it's going to impact them that much. Like it'll mm. be almost imperceptible. But 
certainly there are going to be some people who will not buy it because of her yeah. stance. Or at least like buy it secondhand. Yeah. Yeah. So I think it'll impact another argument for definitely. physical media. I think another thing is that people just don't even know. It's like I, we live in this bubble on the internet where we're on Sifted and we're on Twitter and then we're on Facebook and then we're on YouTube. Like most people aren't like that. Like they they go on Facebook and like that's it. I mean, it build. is an ex, it is an extremely online issue. Yeah, but, it, but and I, and as it continues to happen, it has been reported more and more in the mainstream. Yeah. And I would say and, the only thing on top of that, Shane, though, would be compared to what you would be saying. J.K. Rowling's fans are my age, and we're connected to the internet, and yeah. so the yeah. people that are going to buy this game know about this, and so yep. that it will be interesting. I don't, I don't think it will affect it. If the game's good enough, people are going to buy it. Like, I, I, uh, if it was a direct game written by J.K. Rowling. That might be more of an issue. Yeah, I think I it might I, sell better if it was written directly by. I hate to admit it, but I think it would sell better if it was written directly by her. If, I if, wouldn't if, agree like, with that if you've read The Cursed Child. Oh well, I'm just saying, like, if if it's like the next saga of the Harry Potter, or whatever, written by her. No, I, no, I think the I think the developer. no, I think the bloom is off that rose. <laughs> Even without her comments about trans people, like. Cursed Child and and the fact also consider she wrote the screen or at least has been credited for the screenplays of the Fantastic Beast movies, and they are not bad. tops. That's true. Yep. <laughs> Crimes of Grindelwald. Even my hardcore fan friends are sort of like, mm, I liked mm. it because it's Harry Potter, but yeah. you know That's how like, many of my friends were. That's exactly yeah. how we were. Okay, so sneaky Charlotte Snake was being a jerk on the website in the chat earlier, trying to spoil stuff for people. But I'm going to bury the hatchet and we're going to answer his question. Um, where would you rank The Last of Us Part Two and other first-party PS4 games? We're not going to rank all the PS4 first-party games. That would take, like, another two hours. Maybe just say, if it's not the top for you, what is the top? Go, Matt. Um, I don't know. I haven't finished Last of Us Part Two yet. But, no, uh, that's true. I forgot. It's, it's upper <laughs> echelon. Um, you know, like kind of the, the, top, the top competition right now would probably be It and um, God of War and Spider-Man. Um, I would probably give a slight edge to God of War still, um, but we'll see how I, what I think about Last of Us Part Two when I'm done with it. At, th at this point, I would say that Last of Us Part Two is the best thing I've played this year. I realize it might be damning with faint praise because it hasn't been an amazing year. Yeah, so hasn't far. been a whole lot so far. But like, it's a, it's a, it's going to be the one to beat. Like, I don't know. Like, I'm, you know, I'm looking it's down the, the road for sure. Yeah, definitely looking down the road. I'm thinking like, okay, Ghost of Tsushima, Miles Morales, and Cyberpunk uh, do have a shot, but they got their work. Their work cut is cut out for them. Out for them. Yeah, yep. no, no doubt. Mitch, what about you? Uh, my oh, wrong button. Here we go. <laughs> um, sorry, hit the yeah. wrong button on the tri -caster. Well, you are doing like two things at once. So yeah, sorry. Um, so for me, uh, I think the greatest game ever made was God of War. And I, like so the, I, the PS4 one. The PS4 or, one is, okay. is in my mind the best game ever made and my number one game of all time. Um, I put The Last of Us behind it, but um, I will say narratively, this is the best narrative I've ever experienced in any medium, in any capacity. Um, but I think God of War is just a better game in general. Uh, I agree. God of War number one with a bullet. Uh, I would actually, I would rather play uh, Spider-Man over this because, again, I am like a more interactive gameplay focused guy. But I also would agree that it's one of the best gaming stories I've ever experienced. And if you love that part of gaming, it may be your favorite game ever. I'm not exaggerating. It might be your favorite game ever. Also, JM Rain gave more subs out like a while ago. You the man. Go on, more. Rage. Thank you for Twitch Prime. JM Rain, thank you for that. If I missed anyone else who subscribed with Twitch Prime, I'm sorry. Um, trying to scroll back up, but. Oh my God, there's so many questions. I just scrolled down. I'm so, we're not going to be able to get to all these guys. I'm sorry. Um, I wish we could. Um, let's see. Here's one from Erebus Jones. Do you think the lack of proper showing of FIFA and Madden in the EA show hints maybe at it being in the Xbox reveal? Uh-huh. Yes, I think that yeah. may be possible. That yeah, is 100%. entirely possible, actually. Yeah, that's Madden, pretty insightful. Madden's on your always part been with ever. Xbox. I mean, since they did that TV deal, like... I think the, he's talking more about FIFA, though, because we'd uh, already seen Madden. Remember, we said we got two trailers of Madden before that one where it yeah, was. FIFA different. has traditionally been very PlayStation focused because that, yeah. PlayStation rules Europe. Yep. Um, but uh, that's po I mean, it's possible. Certainly, it would help kind of spice up the, not spice up because I don't care, but like 
I feel like we've been saying Microsoft's going to need help in the lineup and having one more thing that big would be nice. The first real look at FIFA on the Xbox would be a, a feather in the cap. All right, here's one from Potty2. What level of commit, commitment do you think Sony will have for backwards compatibility on PS5? Will there be, uh, with there being relatively few technical hurdles, do you think it'll be able to trade in my PS4 at launch? No. I don't know about at launch. <laughs> no, I don't think you'll But be I wouldn't be surprised it. eventually. Um, yeah. We're going to see, we're gonna have to see what this looks like. And, like, you know, they're saying, like, almost everything will be backwards compatible, and then they will have enhancements for, like, the top 100 games. Um, they're, they, I think Cerny implied that was at launch, but at the same time, you know, Things like that have a tendency to not happen at launch when, when the chips come are down. Um, I do expect that eventually the PS, your PS4 will probably be fairly redundant uh, in terms of your library carrying forward to the PS5. But at launch, that seems optimistic. For me, I wouldn't care. I don't look back. I hardly go back and play old games, but I know most, I am out of the ordinary and I kind of have to be that way just because of what I do. Um, and I know a lot of other people would, be lost if they gave up their PS4 for a PS5. So the games that I would want to go and play back help. are probably going to be already backwards compatible with PlayStation yep. 5, which is Sony's first party lineup. All the big stuff. All the yeah. big stuff. And I think yeah. also they said they're doing a a talk about that next month in July. So we'll know about that pretty soon. Yeah, it just for me it's like often things that are only on the system that are smaller or like more obscure and like a lot of things I, I'd be worried about would be like things that are licensed like the Godzilla game that I kind of liked. It's not great, but I liked it. Transformers Devastation, uh, will that come forward? Because that license has been gone for three years now, I think. Probably not. Um, but I think it might. Like, you know, if it's a thing where you can just make it, you know, I don't think expect PS5 enhancements on it, but it doesn't mean it can't run on it. Um, it'll be interesting to see what how Sony, because it feels like Sony's coming into the backwards compatibility thing a little late. I don't know if they were ready for Microsoft to go in as hard as they did on that. And they're just trying to keep parity. So we'll see what their plan is. But there has been a lot of announcements about things go coming out soon that will go to PlayStation 5 with that easy upgrade. So, oh, yeah. Like that but, like, I, I'm no more longer, interested in... It's to the point I'm just where, more interested in what happens to the back catalog, the stuff. Because yeah. the, the, the you know, I've, I've said for years that the fact that they're pushing digital libraries so hard on the current systems means you have to be able to carry most of them, if not all of them, forward with you on the next system because you're left with nothing after that. You're left with, you're left with Stadia almost after that. If, you just, if I have to give up a bunch of digital stuff to move forward into the ecosystem of the PlayStation 5. So I think that that will be a priority for them, not in the sense that they think that everybody wants to play their old games, but because they want to not have that perception of lost value by buying the new console. Okay, we got to move on. <laughs> we, we, we spent too much time on that one question. Um, Johnny Hurricane, you've seen The Last Dance. Not sure if you are struggling for stuff to watch, but it's about Michael Jordan and the Bulls, and it's really good. Yes, I've watched the whole thing. It's, it is really, really well done. Um, I, what I was impressed about the most was that Michael Jordan had a hand in producing it and let a lot of stuff that made him look really bad go into it. So he looked like a jerk in a lot of that. But I think he also showed in a lot of cases in life what it takes to be the best. And sometimes mm -hmm. it means being a jerk. I mean, that's just the truth. And it feels like maybe he has come to accept that. In like, yeah, he owns it. I mean, Barkley used to tell stories about him being a dick to people for, like, he's been doing that for years. Like, yeah, yep. it was kind of an open thing in the, in the league at the time that, like, yeah, Michael's a jerk to people. Like. But he's so good. What can you say about it? You know, like, yeah. what are you going to do? But like, yeah, that was a real, I don't even care about basketball, but like that, that, that series was really amazing. Like, just, just like Crunch and Naughty Dog right now. Look at the game that just came out and it's been under some severe uh, controversy about Crunch. Yep. Uh, okay. One last question. And we're going to take this one because it's about The Last of Us Part Two. And this one may take a little while to answer, but guys, try to keep your responses short because we're already over. Um, from FF8 Master C. I didn't know if I wanted to answer this, but I'm gonna. Um, thoughts on the drama between Jason Schreier and Jeff Kanata about comparisons between Schindler's List and The Last of Us Part Two. So I am friends with Jeff Kanata, so I'm not exactly an unbiased thing here, but um, Jeff did not compare The Last of Us Two to Schindler's List. He compared the tone and experience of playing it of, of The Last of Us Two. To, to watching Schindler's List. He said that the other games out there, most games are basically aiming for a John Wick kind of tone and experience, whereas 
is what we talked about before. Like, it's not fun to play The Last of Us 2, but you come out of it feeling glad you experienced it. And that same that same feeling can apply to something a movie like Schindler's List. Um, because, you know, I'm not, I don't think anyone went to Schindler's List and had like a, a rollicking good time at the movies, but you came out of it feeling like you, you came out of that, as Ebert would say, you came out of that theater feeling like you, you took more out of that theater than you brought in with you. Um, and that's a valid comparison. He's not saying that zombies are like the Holocaust. He's not saying that The Last of Us 2 is the Schindler's List of video games. He's just saying, this made me feel a similar way to how this made me feel. And I know it was everybody's a careless gonna, comparison. Is what it, I, would say. I mean, if you're if you're as online as we are and Jeff is, you probably should know that that was like yeah. like if I was going to make that comparison, I probably would have used like a Gaspar Noé film, yeah. just because, because in this in the sense of something that's unpleasant, but I'm glad I saw it. Um, but it is it is a bunch of nonsense that people are. It is over that movie is a it. flashpoint for certain people, and understandably so. And I just think it was a big overreaction. And I know Jeff. I'm not like good bros with Jeff. I'm just being honest about how I view the whole thing. Um, I just think it was overblown. I can understand why people may have freaked out at first when they just saw other people say he just compared blah 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 to blah 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 without actually reading the context of what he said. But it's just another one of those mm. internet freakouts that everybody comes back it's to also earth just, and are like that was stupid. It's also just another example of like, hey, if you want to say something that has nuance to it, don't do it on Twitter. Yeah, it's probably not the place. Like, not to blame the victim there, but it's like, yeah, people aren't going to read that properly. Like, we know that. Like, we're, we're aware characters. that that is not, yeah. Yep. Fire Native, thank you for Twitch Prime, my friend. That is awesome. That's it for Game Face 217. We're already over the three-hour limit that we try to put on ourselves. I have a feeling we're going to talk about The Last of Us Part Two again. I still have a ton of stuff that I didn't mention a lot of that will be brought up in our Spoiled, which should be going up here in the next couple of days. I might just have to finish off the game tonight, and then we can record that. Um, and then we can really talk about this game. Finish it, people, so you guys can get it on Spoiled, and we can all converse about it together. Um, it's not that long. You'll be able to make it through here in the next day or two. It's pretty it's long. Nice. It is pretty long. For the kind of game it is. <laughs> it is, for sure. Uh, but anyway, uh, if you're listening on... Um, Apple Podcasts or Google Podcasts or Stitcher or iHeartRadio or any of the other places that Game Face is distributed to now. Uh, you can help us out if you go to patreon.com slash sifted. Kick us some cash if you want to keep hearing these podcasts, you want this content to keep coming. Um, alternately, if you can't afford to help us out, you can always just subscribe via Twitch Prime to our Twitch channel. Uh, it's also very easy and it's free. You can give us two bucks free for, for every month. And that's what we're always talking about in the show when we thank people for Twitch Prime. It's them subscribing to our channel. So if you're listening to this anywhere out in internet land and you feel like you're getting something uh, gratifying out of the show, help us out. We live entirely on user-generated donations. So every dollar makes a difference for us, and we appreciate it. Uh, if you want to know what's going on with Sifted, follow us at Sifted Games on Twitter. You can find me on Twitter at Dinfire. You can find Matt at M Kyle. That's K-E-I-L. And you can find Mitch at M Secor. Um, so we'll see you guys next week for 218. Mitch we may Secor. be talking. Sorry. Mitch Secor, not M Secor. Mitch Secor, S I K O R. Uh, and we'll be back next Tuesday, live here on Twitch at 1 p.m. Pacific, 4 p.m. Eastern. Until then, have yourself a great week. Game face is up and out. 